The thing about the Crow Mags isn't just their live set, it's the fact that two of them follow Hare Krishna. They wanted to chant that shit on record. So you were never down with that? Of course not. I'm intelligent. <laughs> In that interview, it kind of ends with you saying that you and John were on speaking terms. Is that still the case? No, of course it's not the case. You, you can't get in the pit with the snakes and not get bit. Hello, welcome. It's Hardlore time. How are you, Bo? I'm doing so well. As am I, uh, and I'm sure you can see and hear why we're both doing so well. We have an incredible guest today. Hardlore, at the end of the day, means hardcore lore. That's right. That's right. And few bands in history in any genre have as interesting or riveting of a story as the Chromags, especially... In hardcore. Mm. Many twists and turns, uh, which all seem to twist and turn differently, depending on who you ask. So we are asking the man that was there from the beginning, co-founder and co-writer of Age of Quarrel and Best Wishes, Paris Mayhew. Paris, welcome to the show. Thank you. What an intro. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm a little tired. I was recording for the past two days. Two 12 hour days and recording. What are we recording? And doing music? I'm always recording. Yeah, I'm recording music. I, I don't record in a traditional way, like where I write 12 songs and then go into a studio and record it all in one shot. I just record as I go. So, what I worked on for the past two days may be a great song or it may go by the wayside. I just yeah. go in and record everything in and upon a whim and hope for the best. And so far, I've used everything I've recorded, but you know, you never know. Are you doing it all yourself, or do you have like a band? Uh, I, I'm doing it basically the same way I did uh, the first album, Rise of the Agros, where I uh, I make click maps, like I map <laughs> out the entire song, all the tempo changes, and everything as I envision it, and then I perform all the bass and guitars. Awesome. And then, uh, and then I bring drummers in. Like I yeah. had five different drummers on Rise of the Agros. <laughs> Um, you know, whoever's available, a lot of them, a lot of them were just friends who, who were there at the right moment, you know, mm -hmm. when I was doing these, you know, cause I work in the film business and, uh, work on a, you work on a TV show, you work 13, 14 hours a day, five right, right. days a week for years. And, uh, so I would just record on weekends whenever I could, anywhere I could, uh, calling in favors and stuff like that. And one time I was, you know, I just flew out to LA and posted on Facebook jfk to lax or something like that <laughs> and uh i got when i landed there was a text from my friend roy mayorga and he was like oh you're in la come over and jam and i went over the next day and by the time the day was over he handed me a thumb drive with one of my songs recorded in his studio and then i just took that hard drive home and threw it in my desk and sat there for five years <laughs> you know, while something. i was recording other stuff and yeah. trying to form or trying to form a traditional band, mm -hmm. which I didn't have any success with, but I'm not a big fan of waiting for other people mm -hmm. to catch up. So I never stopped doing those things in increments. And suddenly I found, I found myself sitting on a bunch of songs. I didn't even realize how many I had. And then I decided to finish one and put it out. And that was the first single off this one, uh, chaos magic. Oh. And, uh, once I put that out, I figured, you know, maybe I'll put together an EP. So I started bringing all these songs into the studio and finishing them up, starting to finish them up one at a time. Cause that's just the way I like to do it slowly. Mm -hmm. And, um, the next thing you know, I, you know, pulling hard drives off the shelf and that one that Roy and I recorded next thing you know, I had a whole album done without really planning to do it, which is, I really found really good. Cause it was no, pressure i was able to do everything exactly the way i wanted to so yesterday you know i have a friend who has a studio and he just said hey you know you got anything to record and i went over and we spent two days recording and basic basically just making click maps yeah because i my clicks are never like one tempo at the beginning is the same tempo at the end right. it's like ramps and 
peaks yeah. and valleys. It drives engineers crazy, but uh, yep. my engineer <laughs> Georgia is very confident with that. So we could very extensive click map over the weekend. And, how badly do you wish you had click maps for Age of Quarrel and Best Wishes? <laughs> uh, you know, those 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 records are some pretty straight lines. Mm. Yeah. Is that by design or is that just kind of what felt right at the time? At the time, you know, I wrote most of those songs when I was like 15, 16 years old. And I was just kind of like learning my instrument. I, I mean, I kind of knew it, but I was when, when you start playing or writing for me, what completely changes is I start, I have to adapt my playing to what I'm writing and I have to practice what I, what I write and what I play. And I got really good at playing my own music at that time, the stuff that I was being influenced by like motorhead and sex pistols and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. We were probably my, my two primary influencers when I wrote age of Quarrel and rush. Wow. Not very <laughs> much. But, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, there were, there's tempo changes and stuff, but there's no ramping. It's just kind of like suddenly stopping and suddenly starting. I just, I don't think I was sophisticated enough to understand that you could do that kind of thing. Or if you did it, you know, you did it in the studio live and you just slow down. I didn't yeah. know that, you know, you could actually control the map. It's one of the most tedious aspects of putting a record together. But once you get it all mapped out and everything's all set to the grid. It feels so good. It just comes down to knowing it. And if you're the guy writing it, then you know it. And also the way, the way I, you know, because I do it all myself, basically when it, when it comes time to go on tour, I just kind of like, besides Chuck Lenahan, who's um, my, the other guitar player in the group, I have to, you know, scramble around and find people to, to play. And uh, I like to have it all mapped out live. So all the click maps that I make in the recordings end up being used live. Oh, oh, you do wow. the tracks live, no matter where you're playing? Well, I do the, the click live. The click, right. yeah, yeah. And, and de depending who, and I'll have, the, I'll have the click map in my ear. Uh, yeah, I used to do it with, like, in the Chromex, I'd always just have the drummer play, have the, yeah. listen to the click. Uh, and uh, But now, on this last tour, I had to click myself, and was like, I, I will never live without it again. <laughs> wow. I love it. Paris, 10 years ago this May, you did a legendary interview with Noisy and Rod Glacial. It's the only interview with a musician I've ever read twice. <laughs> I, th I think I can honestly say it is my favorite piece of music journalism of all time. Interesting. Um, a big part of this episode is going to be me just kind of getting your thoughts on segments and pieces of that interview 10 years later. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to remind. I mean, brother, I got you. Yeah. Whatever I recounted in that article is just memory, so that won't yeah. be a problem. Of course. That's interesting. I didn't. I don't. I didn't think. I thought that. I thought that article was written by somebody in Spain. France. My memory is France. In yeah. France, that's what yeah. it was. It was a guy in France interviewed me, and he was supposed to appear in a French magazine in French, and then, and then it was suddenly, translated to English. Yeah. It, it was translated, I guess Rod translated it to English, but of course, uh, when the, when the noisy article came out, it came out with a title that wasn't written by the author. I guess it was written by noisy. It said something like amazing shit talker or something like that. And I called up the guy in France and I was like, did you do that? And he said, no. And I said, uh, he goes like, he goes, that must've been noisy. I was like, can you tell me who did that? And he was like, he just got silent on the phone. I think he thought I was going to show up to noise and then punish the guy <laughs> or something. But uh, initially they took it off. And, but I, I saw that you uh, put a connection, a link to that for, for this. Uh, and it, that title is still on them. They, yeah, they did not, they didn't fix that title. Somebody would only think it was shit talking if, if, if they didn't know it was true. Uh. I mean, or if they just didn't read it because something Bo and I talked about is how, how like the the facts are hostile because they're just they're read that way, but you're completely calm. You even you read completely calm, which right. like that Cat Williams interview that just went up at some point. At some point, he says like the truth doesn't need inspiration, which it, <laughs> it like I got that even rereading that today just to go over this again. And the, tr and the truth has a ring to it. That's you know not just a saying. Have you gotten a lot of praise or? Opposite of praise for that interview in the last decade. I never get much negativity when right after I wasn't really involved in music at that yeah. time when I did that interview. So it was kind of a left field 
interview. And I had, uh, you know, I've been working in the film business for quite a long time. I didn't even think of myself as a musician anymore. I remember back then I used to actually say, I got used to saying the words, I used to be a musician. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so when that interview came up, it was kind of like one of these things where, you know, in the, in the music business and in the press and all that's related to the music business, everything that's involved in the music business is basically this. You're either on the inside or you're on the outside. And on that, at that t- time, I was on the outside, very much so. And, it, and it's strange how that happens. I guess I wasn't so immersed in social media back then. Um, and I wasn't connected the way I am to like so many fans around the world. It amazes me once my wife forced me to go on Facebook and I had 5,000 friends in like two weeks and I suddenly felt reconnected, which was a very strange thing. Cause at that, I think the significance of that, uh, of that interview was I was on the outside and the other guys were still on the inside and had a voice in the press and they were basically, you know, doing what they needed to do to be able to move forward with, with what they were doing. And there was really no way for them to move forward in an honest way with the Chromags without me. Like, how do you go forward without the prim- primary songwriter in the band? So what they ended up doing was spinning these stories about how, like John's like, I started the band and Holly's like, I started the band. And, uh, you know, and and that's the, that would be the only way, especially for Harley to move forward because he always like, is the you know self self uh, appointed you know you know credit grabbing type guy about mm-hmm. everything which is so you know it, it was all completely false so at that point when I did that interview it might have seemed pointed to a lot of people because they you know people like to think they understand things you know people will get defensive about things that they think they understand especially insider information about a band they like yeah. So when they hear something else, they, their, their brain fights it, their ego fights it. And so you, there was a lot of division with the fans and stuff like that. But I think after people read it, I was really, really surprised because, again, I thought it was only going to appear in the French magazine. Right. And then suddenly I was at concerts and people were coming up to me, you know, basically saying what you just said. Yeah. They were like, uh, you know, that interview you did, it really opened my eyes he goes, all, no matter how many of the other stories that I've heard, they all just sounded like blunt uh, claims. And there was nothing, there was no substance to any of the claims. It was just kind of like, you're a jerk. I'm the guy type stuff. And you just answered questions and you didn't think about the answers to the questions. And I said, well, of course, you know, why, why do you, have to, you don't have to think about memory. You just. One of my favorite things, I, I remember when that interview came out. And I just remember my whole life, the story was so binary from being young and getting into hardcore and Chromax and everything. It was like there was Camp A and Camp B. And suddenly when that came out and like the rumors and blah, 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 there was like a secret Camp C that was Paris's camp. And it's like very exciting to to like not not to discredit anybody else's contributions or whatever. But for me, when it when it comes to like what I like in a band, it's like the guy who wrote the riffs. That's what as a guitar player myself, that's what I'm, what I'm drawn to. So of course I was excited to like see an interview like this and to get this third perspective that as Colin said, seems, or as both of you said, it's pointed, but it's very, it's very matter of fact. Well, and, and to your point about what you say you like about a band, you know, the, 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 the source of the music, that's the whole point of having a name, like Coca-Cola. You go into the deli and you buy a Coca-Cola and there's lemonade in the can and you're like, well, this is pretty good lemonade, but I wanted a Coke. <laughs> you kind of get mad because, you know, you wanted a Coke and that's why you have a band name. And, you know, these guys, both of them went off in both directions selling lemonade. <laughs> Quote of the day. Good God, Paris, this is good. <laughs> um, the, the modern music audiences have been taught the performer is really the only thing that matters when like mm. Bo and I love we, we, we love the writer yeah we love we love a liner note we love reading who did what me too to us to our generation so much of what hardcore is and means is defined by those songs on Age of Quarrel so 
for you as as a young lad in the Bronx, raised in hell, getting into music, getting into guitar, Sex Pistols and Motorhead, you said, were the, the big two bands in terms of writing for early Chromag stuff? Yeah, they were they were kind of the turning point bands. You know, I was I I was raised and still listen to Yes and Rush and Van Halen and Aerosmith and all the great bands of that era. That's what initially made me want to be a musician. Mm. But in that era, you know, you had guys like Eddie Van Halen and Steve Howe and, and these and, you know, bass players like Chris Squire and Geddy Lee and drummers like Neil Peart and John Bonham. And it just seemed like the men and women that were making rock and roll back then, they were just cut from a different cloth. You know, they were yeah. not like regular people. It, it wasn't something that was attainable. And, you know, I would go and I, you know, I, I think by that time I'd already seen Van Halen a bunch of times and, uh, and I'd seen Yes and I'd seen The Police and all these bands, you know, these great bands. And uh, it just seemed what they were doing was unattainable and mystery, especially the Yes and Rush albums, like what they were doing. Like I just couldn't even fathom what they were doing. Drum wise, I mean, that's, that is unattainable. <laughs> and then and I heard Van the Halen, that is unattainable skill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I heard the Sex Pistols. And the Sex Pistols kind of like were kind of astonishing to me because at that in that era in the late seventies it seemed like rock and roll was like in, you know many peaks and valleys was disappearing and the last holdout was really Van Halen and everything was turning cars and Blondie and Flock of Seagulls and all that kind of stuff so I when I heard the Sex Pistols it was almost like further in the heavier side than I ever expected to ever hear again. And I just loved it right away. And, and I, I remember because I was, you know, I was like, you know, it, 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 as a kid in New York, you have a lot more freedom than I think uh, a lot of other people had, you know, because when I was a teenager, the drinking age didn't matter because there was no, there were no beat cops in New York city. Mm. Like it was too dangerous for cops to walk the street. They were only in cars. Wow. So you didn't have cops like walking in the bars, checking IDs, anything like that. It was, it was non-existent. Every bar, you know, that I started to go to when I was like 14 years old. And that's another thing. You could go into a bar. Nobody would ask you for ID because there was no, there was no repercussions. There was no consequences. So there was a whole entire youth culture in bars. And that's why so many bands came out of New York in that era. Because it was like, you know, I, I started going into this bar on Avenue A in Manhattan. And uh, when I was like 14, you know, I just testing the waters. I was skateboarding around. It was a totally, you know, burnt out buildings, rent strike posters on all the buildings. And, you know, just, it was just junky lines of junkies a block long waiting to buy heroin, you know, that comes down in a bucket and in a rope. And there was this one bar on Avenue A called the Park Inn Tavern. And I just walked in with my skateboard and just looked around. There was nobody in there. It wasn't even a bartender. So I like sat down at the bar and a few minutes later, I see this head stick out in the back, you know, like his head just pops out and looks around and he looks at me. There's a <laughs> guy with red hair. His name was red, actually. Red Morrison. <laughs> Why'd they and call he him comes that? up and he comes up and he had turned out to be a good friend of mine years later. And he comes out and he walks up behind the bar and he like puts his hand down on the bar and he takes a look to the left. He takes a look at the right and he looks at me and he goes, can I help you? There I am sitting there, 14 years old, with my skateboard, and, I, and it was like 12:30 in the afternoon. And I said, uh, "Goddamn right, you can." Can I have a pitcher of beer? He goes, <laughs> "You want a pitcher of beer?" And I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Are you alone?" I said, "Yeah." And he just slammed his hand down on the bar. He goes, "That's what I'm talking about." Oh my God, red! <laughs> and he poured me a beer, and it, and, and just the, this bar, the park in. Turned out to be, you know, like, I don't know what drew me in there. It was right across the street from a little punk rock club, hardcore punk rock club, when the transition has happened, called A7. Oh. And so I started going into this bar, the parking, because I could drink there. And I was trying to bring my friends from school there, but none of them would come with me because they were afraid to go to that neighborhood. I remember one time getting off the subway with this one kid, and I was walking down, like, from, from, from Astor Place to 3rd Avenue. And he's like, where are we going? And we go from 3rd Avenue to 2nd Avenue, going further east. When we got to 2nd Avenue, he just stopped and he refused to go any further east than 2nd Avenue. And if you don't, if, I guess you don't know New York, but like 
We actually do know that area. We got lost there with Mike Dijon about. I couldn't get them to go any further than Second Avenue, but I, you know, they left me, so I just went went on and went over to this bar. But every time I go into this bar, which I became a regular, and I started noticing like these little clusters of punk rock kids, other teenagers, you know, across the street. And then that's when I heard the Sex Pistols. The Sex Pistols came on through the speakers and just blasting through the speakers. And like, and just thinking about it, I'm getting chills on my arm. Wow, so that was the effect it had on me. You know, I just got these chills. I was like, I just heard Johnny Rotten's voice go, right now, right now. I mean, even right now, I feel the power of that. And I'm just standing there listening to it. And I'm looking around and I see this like group of punk rock guys, like long trench coats and shaved heads and spiked hairs and stuff like that. And they were older though. They must've been like, you know, 19 or something like that. And I was 14. Yeah. It was a big difference when you're 14 or oh, 18. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I thought to myself, oh, I got I to gotta find out who this is. They must know. So I walked up to these kids and I was like, oh, excuse me. Uh, and they all looked, looked down at me. And one of them goes, yeah, what? And I said, this song, who, who's this song? And one of them looks down and he goes, Sex Pistols, dick. Oh. I was like, thank you very much. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and, you know, and the next day I went to school and we had these like three punk rockers. And uh, we had only a three punk rockers in our school. And uh, they were dressed like the Ramones. They all had leather jackets and that haircut. Yeah. And they always stood together, like the three of them. And I walked up to them and I was like, um, excuse me? And they were like, and they looked, looked down at me again. And I'm like, what do you want? And I was like, do you have a Sex Pistols album I can borrow? And one guy looks at me and, go, and he looks at the other guy and he goes, yes. Wow. Yes, I Whoa. do. And wow. the next day he brought it and he loaned it to me and I had it for a couple of days and immediately I was like, I have to own this. And the, the significance of listening to that album and hearing it and loving it was, I was like, oh, you don't have to be Eddie Van Halen or Steve Howe to, to make music that really moved me. And I, when I brought the record back to these guys, I handed it to the guy and, and he said to me, if you like this kid, you'll like the stimulators. Wow. And I said, who's that? And he said, well, they're a local band and they play all the time. Just look in the Village Voice. There's a newspaper and in the back of the newspaper, there's like 10 pages where all the clubs are. You know, because back then we had such a vibrant live uh, venue uh, scene in New York that there were 10 pages of live venues that had shows. And every, you know, it became my routine. I would, every Wednesday I'd go and look at the Village Voice to see if the stimulators were playing. When I saw the stimulators, I also saw the bad ones. Wow. And then again, this phenomenon of thinking to myself, wow, you don't have to be those guys. And I decided I needed to start a band. That that was like a that was a major, major turning point. And Motorhead. And I heard Motorhead. I heard Ace of Spades. So Ace of Spades, I, I, I kind of went forth in the world with Ace of Spades and never mind the bollocks. And would come home every day after school and sit with my bass because I was primarily a bass player. And I just started writing this new batch of songs. And one of the first songs that I wrote, I went home instead of trying to be Getty Lee, I tried to be Lenny. Yeah. And I wrote World Peace, you know, just sat in a blast and wrote, you know, all those parts back to back and, uh, and, and said, this is going to be my new band. And, uh, and I just, and I continued writing in that vein and then uh, looking for people to play with. And I did what kids did back then as I made a flyer. Took a sharpie and I made a fly and said musicians want bass player seeks musicians to start band. And I went down to the Lower East Side and I went to CBGBs and I went to Bleaker Bob's and I went down to Avenue A and I put up this flyer and uh and that was the beginning of how the Chrome started because I that's how I met the guys in, in uh, that ended up being the Chrome So who responded to the letter? Was it the letter that did it? Well, it almost before I before I started writing the songs, I had this other band. It was you know, called Reported Missing, and the singer had quit at some point because he was like hanging out on Lower East Side and you know getting into punk rock and all that kind of stuff, and he wasn't getting what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But the last song that I tried to play with him and the other guys in the band was World Peace, and he was actually the one who named the song. Like I came in with this new song, and they were on all the, the other two guys, the guitar player and the drummer, were looking at me like, "What the fuck is this?" But Paul, the singer, was like, this is great. This song should be called World Peace Can't Be Done. Wow. And then he never wrote lyrics to it because we broke. He quit and then we broke up. But before yeah. he left, 
he gave it that moniker. So I just ended up always calling it world peace can't be done. And then, um, so he, you know, basically disappeared. I didn't see him for a while and I'm out putting up these flyers and I'm in front of 171A, which is where Rat Cage Records was downstairs and upstairs was 171A, uh, the recording studio with the Bad Brains of the original war cassette. Figured that would be a good place to put up a flyer. Yeah. You know? And, uh, so I, I'm, I'm there with a scotch tape, putting this flyer on the on the wall above the rat cage, and I hear this voice go, "Paris," and I turn around, and it's Paul, the singer of my former band, walking down the street with Harley Flynn. Wow! And so that's basically how it all started. And and then the original band was me, Paul, and Harley. But it didn't last very long because what you know what it basically was was like, you know, Harley like looks at the flyer and says to Paul, he was like, "Why don't you play with him?" And he's like, oh, I can't play with Paris. Play, Paris plays bass like, you know, like Rush. She's like too good for me. And Paul was just trying to become a guitar player. Mm. And he wrote great songs on that guitar. He wrote uh, two songs that are on the first Murphy's Law album. Oh, wow. Because uh, they, they, when, we, when we were playing together, these were songs that he had written. And uh, later on, he became good friends with Jimmy. What a small world New York was. Harley and... Uh, uh, and Paul were playing together, which was only a couple of times, you know, one time and just a couple of times in a few apartments. And, uh, and then Paul just bowed out. But it was basically on Paul's recommendation that uh, Harley was interested in hearing how I played. But Paul was really selling it hard. And <laughs> apparently Harley was trying to start a band at the time and he had like five bands and he was, you know, testing the waters, I guess, or hedging his bets. He was playing with everybody in town, it seemed, but nothing was working out. And uh, when we started playing together, he was saying, oh, I have this other band and we're about to play this gig and I'm playing drums in Murphy's Law. And it was just like all kinds of stuff like that. But, uh, and so initially when we started the promos, it was all my music because uh, I had this like batch of songs and I guess he was just testing the waters, you know, the same way he was sure. testing the waters with all these other bands. He wasn't like committing to anything, seeing sure. how things worked out. And then I guess after we had four or five of my songs uh, hashed out, it was like, I think it became a little bit more apparent which one was going to take off. I wonder if uh, that kid, one of the Ramones kids at your school, if he has any idea, the domino that he knocked over and the like literal thousands of people he inadvertently influenced. That's a good question. I don't know. You know, uh, I I never saw those guys again. <laughs> that was their last. You know, it, which is, <laughs> that was them. which is weird because you know, with all the punk rock shows that I ended up going to because of them, you know, going to see this, it wasn't like I went to a stimulator show and I ran into those guys. Yeah, posers, dude. No, well, yeah. well I, you know, the thing is, they were like Ramones guys. Yeah, and the Ramones, you know, in my book, like if I didn't know that the Ramones were so big and popular. They just don't mean anything to me. Mm. Like, you know, I, when I listened to the Sex Pistols, it wasn't just natural for me to go out and buy all the Ramones albums, too. I just, they didn't, they didn't make any sense to me. I didn't mm. see the connection between right. the Ramones and the Sex Pistols at all. If anything, the Ramones seemed more like, like music had made this split at that time with Cars and Blondie and everything going this way and, you know, Van Halen and Sex Pistols or anything that was heavy going in this direction. Yeah. And, it's, and if anything, it seemed like the Ramones would have gone that way. So melodic. You know, yeah. the stuff that I was like, I like the Dead Boys and Sex Pistols and heavy stuff. These guys were clearly fans of the Ramones. And probably to them, that scene was dead. And what we went off and did probably didn't interest them. Mm. Yeah, the re redefining the genre. That was the whole point of, of us, you know, transitioning into using the name hardcore. It was mainly to separate ourselves from the punk rock scene. Because I, I mean, I know how I felt about it. I felt like we were distinguishing ourselves for what we were doing. Not, not, I didn't feel like we were continuing what the Ramones and the Sex Pistols were doing. I felt like, if anything, I felt I was writing songs that were like Motorhead, and, but didn't turn out that way. You know, like I was, you know, as a, you know, Bo mentioned, you know, why he likes musicians the writers and stuff you know I, I definitely think of myself as a scholar of songwriting and you hear people in the past talk about how songs came about and i remember reading something about the sex pistols saying you know they were trying to be like the basic rollers or something like that 
really? they're trying to write songs like that or Bowie. They were wow. like they wanted to be like Bowie. And Jesus. but what came out was never mind the bollocks. And <laughs> you know, I when I thought I was writing it was like Motorhead, and it came out to be like Age of Quarrel. Right. So a lot of times when you when you have a, a vision in mind, you get in the way. Yeah, I mean, your identity is going to your identity as a writer is going to just define itself. There's only so much you can do to, like, define what it is. Yeah. And you can't turn off anything else. Like, I wasn't able to turn off my, you know, my the thousands of times I listened to uh, to Hemispheres and Feral the Kings and, and all those Rush albums. And uh, I found myself constructing uh, chord progressions because of. The, the song Anthem by Rush, you know, the song Signs of the Times wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Anthem. Oh, wow. And they basically wow. took the intro riff to Anthem. Dang it, ticket the bomb, ticket the band, ticket the bomb, ticket the band, ticket the bomb, 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 ticket And I played it backwards. Instead of going ding dong, I went dong dong, 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 But I played it more like Lemmy as opposed to Alex Lifeson. And there, Signs of the Times was born. And that's it, guys. That's all it is. Just play the fucking riff you like backwards. <laughs> you have literally said that. Well, you know, the thing was, I was kind of like, I kept saying to myself, I don't understand how this riff is so good. It's basically one note, play right. high note, low note, high note, low note. I was like, how, how does this sound so good? You know, it's a kid, you know, a 14, 15 year old kid trying to fumble his way, brute force his way into understanding why something so simple was so heavy. And so I just started playing it. And I was like, what if you played it backwards? And oddly (laughs) enough, the funny thing is the chorus is to make the chorus different than the verse in Signs at a Times. We flipped it. So that's just it. You just did it. It it went back to being. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) And that's it. What have I been saying, guys? Just do that. You know, there's a, I mean, if you know the Revenge album, there's a song called Without Her, which is very much uh, spirit radio. In that interview, you called Revenge your your like greatest source of recorded musical pride. Is that still true? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Rise of the Agros is the answer now. This album is 10 times that album. Okay. Wow. In my opinion. When we, you know, when we made Revenge, it was, uh, you know, I wrote 90% of the songs. I produced the album. Sounds incredible. I had a boatload of money uh, from Universal Music to make it. The luxury of being able to cater to the horseshit that the other people had to, I had to have that buffer to, to get the other guys to be able to perform. I mean, I went in, we were in the studio for, we must have been in the studio for six months. Holy shit. You know, I, reto- I recorded all my guitar tracks in three days. Right. Wow. So the other six months was doing the other stuff. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Before we move on from like childhood stuff, something that I, I, a quote that I read was, you mentioned how people will often say that like, oh, the Cro-Mags brought punks and skins and metalheads and all kinds of people together. And then you finish the quote by saying, I never really saw myself as any of those things, but it's not, it's like a nice thought. I definitely was certainly not looking for a tribe. I'm not a, I'm not a joiner. Um, but that, but that, you know, to a large extent back then there was the, the tribe wasn't so defined mm-hmm. as it is now. It's like what a hardcore person is now is like, Oh, they're dressed like this. They have, you know, they, they like these bands, the hard, the, the hardcore scene that, that started to transition out of the punk scene was very much, very eclectic. You know, you had the Dead Kennedys and Minor Threat, and you had the Bad Brains and the Gnostic mm-hmm. Front, and you had the Crumb Suckers and the Chrome Mags and the Misfits. And mm-hmm. like, what did these bands really have in common? <laughs> Something. Being from the tri-state area. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's very convoluted and it's, it's kind of unclear. And, and I, I, you know, I remember when I used to, go and hang out with all these guys and uh, you know the other guys in the promex were very much into being a tribe being mm-hmm. joining something you know like there was this whole skinhead thing and like when we first started the band you know harley would always be like we have to have this we have to have a concept uh you know we'll be called the bald eagles and we'll be a skinhead band we'll accept paris 
And uh, everybody in the band will have, <laughs> like, once you turn 17, you can't be in the band anymore. Well, I mean, except Paris, because he's 17. You know, it was like, there was always this, like, laundry list of things that you had to do, mm. except Paris. Yeah. Because I was allowed to do anything I wanted, because I was writing songs. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Although I am a part of that seminal group that spawned hardcore music, and I feel very akin to it, uh, I, I don't know if I was, I, I, I don't know if you could have picked me out of a lineup. And, you know, I remember one time the whole band got arrested in Texas, and the cop asked me if I was a hitchhiker. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes, sir. And I was the only one who didn't get handcuffed. Wow. Wow. And I, and I rode to the police station in the squad car in the front seat. Well, it's funny too. Cause I'm, I'm thinking of even um, we'll get there, but in, in that clip from the beat, like everybody very much looks apart and you're just rocking and you're, you're just, I think you're wearing even just like a collared shirt, just like, just not ever like Doug's wearing a Cro-Mac shirt, you know, when anybody new joined the band, Harley would descend upon them and dress them. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, you know, he very much wanted to have some kind of like, you know, he wanted me to all be basically like him. And I just never was interested in that. I couldn't really understand it. And then they just finally gave up. You said earlier, um, we started calling it hardcore. Mm. Yeah. I, rem- I mean, I remember staying on a street corner with Paul Dordal, the guy, the kid that I told you was in my previous band and introduced me to Harley. And, you know, when we were talking about starting this band of Bald Eagles, <laughs> uh, he was like, Paul, you know, because, you know, I would say this, you know, we would stand on street corners and talk about this stuff very seriously. Like, what are we going to be? Are we going to be punk rock? Are we going to be this? And I was like, and I just remember him asking me that. I was like, are we going to be punk rock? And I remember saying, I just don't you know. I'm, you know, I love the sex business. They're awesome. I just, you know, I grew up in New York City. Being called a punk is probably the worst thing you can be called. And I will never, I will, that will never go away. When I was a little kid, little kid up until I was a teenager, the worst thing that anybody could call you on the street was a punk. And then all of a sudden there was this punk rock thing. And I'm supposed to suddenly go, oh, I like punk rock. You can call me a punk now. <laughs> no, I don't think so. So when, when Paul was saying that, which, and I told him, I was like, you know, I'm not really interested in that. And that was the first time I heard the word hardcore when Paul said to me, he goes, so do you prefer calling it hardcore? I was like, I don't know. What's that? And I, I don't remember what his expl- explanation was, but it was the first time I ever heard it. And I was like, well, I'd rather it be called that. Yeah, that's a, oh, a cool ass word or a derogatory yeah. remark. It was also a weird word at the time, too. I, I kind of like crunched my head to that, too, because at that time, hardcore just referred to porn. Right. Of course. Like, if you heard the word hardcore, you just thought, porn. you know, I read an article the other day where they had interviews with Lane and Kent and, and uh, Chris Cornell and all those guys asking him about, you know, grunge. None of them had a hand in that word. That right. was suddenly thrust upon them. So to a certain extent, you know, over the years, people have asked me, you know, what kind of music is Chromags? I always, I always like to say that it's, it was Chromags. Because yeah. we <laughs> certainly weren't a punk band. And, uh, you know, at the time, I think in the 80s, we were probably as hardcore as you could be. Yeah. But like music has changed and, you know, hardcore didn't just mark that time. You know, people have embraced it and people live it now that weren't even alive then. And they live it 100 percent. Yeah. You know. It's just, you know, it's no different than R&B or anything. It's just, you know, what, I, I guess at the time I just thought, you know, punk should mark that time in the late 70s and hardcore would have been our time. And then whatever people come along afterwards would want to distinguish themselves the uh, way we did and come up with some other name. But I guess if you're not corporate press and there's not people hired to point at you and say, this is what you are, yeah. I guess those those monikers aren't changing as often as they used to. Oh, mm-hmm. there's no big trend. Yeah. Like, not since grunge have I heard of anything like that. No, so, I mean, there are some like corny ones out there that we won't repeat, but you, you know, you, you rebelled so that we didn't have to in that sense. <laughs> so thanks. But, but, you know, I, you know, when I made, when I made revenge and when I made age of quarrel, I didn't go in with any plan except for that. I sit in my room and play my guitar yeah. and I play it till I hear something I like. Did you write uh, steal my crown? I wrote parts of it. Why, why do you ask? <laughs> That's a banger. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you did good. On and, that you know, and I did the same thing with this, you know, I just, 
this is this is just the result of me playing my guitar in my room for a, a number of years. Usually, a band's first album is the result of a lifetime of, sure. of what they aspire to be, and when they finally get to the chance to make that first album, it, it basically represents them musically for their whole life up to that point. And then they make the second album, and it represents a year. <laughs> <laughs> which is a tough thing. So even though I've made three albums before, prior, previously with Chrome Eggs, you know, this album feels like a, like my first album. And you get to start fresh on a thing where there's no rules or preset notions of what it is or what. Yeah. Chrome Eggs were, it was very um, adversarial and territorial and, mm. and, you know, people breaking up in clicks and it was all suddenly them against me and that kind of thing. Uh, uh, decisions weren't made uh, for the benefit of the band. Oftentimes decisions were just made to shut me down or try to shut me down. And why was that? Why was that? It's, it's you know, it's, it's the negotiation to agree thing that happens in a, a turmoil filled relationship. We, we argued about lunch. We argued about <laughs> I mean, songs. Yeah. You know, it, it just became everything. And then, then, then it becomes at some point, some kind of like uh, method of diplomacy where you begin to agree for th to things that you don't really care about. Right. So you give them a win so you can have a win on a song. Mm -hmm. Okay. Give them lunch. They can have lunch. You guys win lunch, but I don't know. Song this way. So you won lunch one day and they won Hari Hari Krishna, 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 Hari Hari. They wanted to chant that shit on record. Yeah. I read so you that. You were never down with that. Of course not. I'm intelligent. outstanding when i this is a real full circle moment for me because a friend in high school gave me a burn cd with age of quarrel and master killer on it and obviously we'll get to that later too but that burn cd was like a very important thing for me and immediately my favorite song was it's the limit which i know was one of the first songs you wrote and uh had a different title for a minute kill the ayatollah <laughs> okay so I remember, but I would love to know where Dana -na, Na came from. <laughs> and then the, like, just the, just the inspiration to, to play that through on the verse riff and then go up a half step. So it's a little higher and then into what would be the bridge, the breakdown. We've said before, that's both of our favorite Cromag song. And it's also like just kind of the perfect blueprint on how to write a hardcore song. Yeah. Yeah. Could you break well, it down to us? Yeah, I can. I remember writing it in my mom's kitchen. Uh, it was probably the first song that I wrote on the bitch. Oh, oh, actually, wow. I never even thought about this. I didn't write it on this bitch. By that, you mean your red BC Rich behind you, right? The 1981 BC Rich. For the audio listeners. I went to the guitar store to buy this. Okay. And I didn't buy this one first. I bought a wood grain one. So when I was, you know, I was a kid, I was, you know, I was very young and I went into the guitar store and it was like a, an astronomical uh, investment. And so uh, I went into the store and I must have been playing. They had, I think they had like 10 of these really? different colors and stuff. Wow. And a number of other guitars. And I just lined them up and I played them over and over, over all day long. I was driving the salesman crazy. And I got down to the end and it was this one and a wood grain one. And I just couldn't see myself playing a red guitar. You know, at that time, it just seemed too flashy to me. Yeah. So yeah. I got the wood grade one and I took it home and I wrote It's the Limit on that guitar. And I totally would never have remembered that if you hadn't asked. And I remember writing that song. There were other parts to it, but yeah. I was just trying, you know, I was I was trying to do that Lemmy thing with the right hand. And I was just letting my my hand, my left hand fly around. It was almost yeah. like irrelevant. Um, but I mean, the skank part is basically just the initial fast part slowed down. Right. It's just, this, it's the same riff, which is something I do. I do often myself, but, yeah. um, but why going up? Yeah. I know, it was just, just like, ah, we need a, a verse B, uh, you know, back then I didn't know anything about music really. So I really brute forced myself and I would just play and play and play and play. Yeah. Until I heard something that appealed to me and I had like this little cassette recorder that my dad gave me. And if I heard something I liked, I would play it yeah. and then I would record it really quick. And um, so, yeah, that's how I, that's how I wrote It's Limit. But anyway, 
I played that yeah. guitar all week and uh, it wouldn't stay in tune. I walked into the store with my grandmother and we walked in thinking, you know, I would just, you know, it would be routine kind of thing. And I walked in with the guitar and I put it down on the counter and the guy's like, what can I do for you? And I said, uh, I bought this guitar last week and it won't stay in tune. And the guy's like, what do you mean? I said, I said, no matter what I do, it won't stay in tune. And I said, I have an acoustic guitar. I've been playing for years and I play bass and I'm like, I have no problem tuning my guitars. This guitar will not stay in tune. There's a problem with that. I'm sure with him. He goes, you said you bought it last week? I said, yeah. He goes, well, we had a seven-day return policy. What day did you buy it exactly? And it was a week and a day. And the, I'm sitting, we're standing there, and the guitar case is open. I'm looking at this guitar, and I'm like, you know, 15 years old. And being told no. Yeah. yeah. No. yeah. And uh, for, like, the, the most expensive thing I had ever bought in my life. Right. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and so I just, like, I looked around, and it was a wall of less calls. And I just reached into the guitar case and I grabbed the guitar by the neck, like a baseball bat. And I turned around and walked up to that wall of Martians. And I looked back at the guy and I was like, how many of these guitars do you think I can smash before you can stop me? <laughs> and I lifted it up like this. And my grandma was like, yeah, you creep. <laughs> and, the, and the guy's like behind the counter, like, and I, and I just started going like this. He's like, no, 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 stop. Which one do you want? And the wood grain one, I mean, uh, the red one was right there on the wall. Yeah. So I said, that one. And he goes, okay, take it, take it. So I put the, I put the red one, uh, the wood grain one down and I grabbed the red one and he's still behind the counter. And I just walk up to the case and I put it down in the, in the same case right in front of him. And I close the case. Yeah. And we, me and my grandmother just walk out. The perils of owning a guitar shop in, in the Bronx, huh? No, that was Sam Ash on 48th oh, Street. Oh, oh, Sam, Sam, Ash. Oh, Sam Ash had it coming. Those bastards. When Sam too. Ash was a single store. Bo, you mentioned before Paris's quote about when cro came to town, skaters, punks, metalheads, and re regular kids came, and that you never see that. And that's kind of where we are today with hardcore, Paris. And... Mm. um Bo and I saw you walking around the Brooklyn Monarch show a couple months ago mm -hmm. that I played, and we were definitely both like, "Oh shit, Paris is here. That's bad." Yeah, I, yeah. I literally went like, "Oh shit, I've never <laughs> shit, never Paris. seen him before." <laughs> yeah. What are your thoughts on where hardcore is today? Well, I'll start by saying that I think it's great. You know, for me as an artist reemerging, that there is an existing, uh, you know, infrastructure. Yeah, but I guess to a large extent because of that, I've been going to a lot, a lot of show, more shows lately, and seeing how vibrant it is and how many bands are playing, and uh, and I did get to see some of the biggest hardcore shows I ever saw uh, in the past couple of years when Turnstile put out that that album, that you know that big breaking album for them, and. Uh, Mm -hmm. And going to a show where there's like 2,000 people and, you know, I know, I know a lot of people, I don't know why, poo-poo on them, but um, I come from a different era where, like what we discussed earlier, that there was this uh, eclectic nature to all the bands. And if you took, if you took five of the current hardcore bands today, and, and Turnstile was one of them, and you went back to 1983, the only one that would fit in would be trying to stop. Mm. Whoa. Wow. Hell of a quote. Yeah. Uh, to me, they, they, they have a little bit of the beastie boys and a little bit of the bad brains and a little mm -hmm. bit of the, 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 and, and they're very musical, but they, but they're still doing their thing. And uh, so when I got to see, I've seen, I've seen them twice in the past couple of years and they were, you know, playing huge venues and the crowd was just like you said, you know, if you stood in the crowd and looked around, you wouldn't really be too sure what kind of music you were listening to. But I didn't find it that much different the other day when I went to the mono. I'm, I'm always happy to see that people are out enjoying live music. And, uh, so that's how, I, that's how I feel the state of it is. It's still, it, it, feel, it feels very, very different than when, mm -hmm. when I was in, in the 80s when I was a teenager, mostly because I knew everybody. Yeah. You know, the scene was so small. You know, you'd go to a show and you'd see, you know, whatever, 200 people there. And then when you left the show, 50 of them would go with you someplace else, mm -hmm. you know, and hang out in the park. And it wasn't, it, so in a large, to a larger extent, it wasn't like we went to the show to see each other. We were always together. Right. 
every time there was a show, we all went. So it was it was very much a like you know a very high school culture type thing. We saw the same people every single day. Nothing like that will ever exist again. So you, to lament over that is a waste of your time. It's yeah. probably a good thing overall that the fourteen year olds aren't at the bars. You know, that's for Perhaps. the best. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I went at that show. It was it was funny. The closest person to me who I knew who would care was Vogel. And I went up to Vogel. I was like, I think Paris just walked by. And and Scott looked over and went, he looks good. <laughs> <laughs> that was the whole interaction. Uh, but that's good. That makes me that. Uh, Paris that, looks good. <laughs> quote. Front page. Page. Let's get to a uh, little bit of <laughs> an hour in. Let's just get right into it. <laughs> Hey, you know, I, I saw, I'm sorry I realized that about 15 seconds ago, I said to myself, they haven't gotten to the article Dude, yet. This is good. This is exactly no, what no, we no. want. This is what we want. This We want this to guide itself, you know. Yeah. We're just here. We're auxiliary. Yeah. You're, the, you're the focus. When it came to writing Chromag's demos and Age of Quarrel, um, you've made it very clear that most of the time it was just, or if not all the time, it was just you and Harley in a room. You wrote the songs. You brought them to Mackie to learn the drums. You brought them to Eric and John to write vocals and lyrics. When it came time to find a singer, who who was first? Was it John or was it Eric? Eric. Eric was just our friend, you know. That's that's also how it was back then. There wasn't this big stable of musicians to, to choose from. You know, the, the ranks of the band, of all the bands, you know, except for maybe the Crumb Suckers because they like lived down on Long Island and they were basically yeah. regular kids. Um, you know, me and Harley, you know, because I've been writing a bunch of songs before I met him. And then when I met him, it was like, okay, we're going to start a band. But he had like five other bands. And so I would just write the songs and we would, he would, you know, come up to where I, I, I went to the high school of art and design on 57th Street and we would just, meet me after school at three o'clock because he didn't go to school and he would just meet me after school and uh we'd either go to my apartment and jam or we would walk down to a bar and talk about the music endlessly 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 and again like Two i beers, said initially, please, <laughs> initially it was you know us based him you know to a, to a certain extent just like harvesting my music initially mm -hmm. just i guess to see how it, like i said like how it would turn out and so we spent a lot, a lot of time in rooms, just me, you know, because I was like on fire at that time, you know, that new inspiration motorhead. And, and uh, we'd go and we'd sit and I would play the songs, which were, which were world peace first and, and it's the limit and life of my own and hard times. And that, those were like uh, uh, Seekers of the Truth, which was called, which had a different title. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we would just. I would imagine. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, and, it, and at some point along, you know, there's this whole like myth about how Harley wanted to, he had this mission to set, start the Chromags and how he made this recording that was the demos for the Chromags. It's all revisionist horseshit history. When I met him, there was no like the band is called the Chromags and you're joining. It wasn't called yeah. the Chromags. There was, was no name. It was like, hey, we're starting a band. Let's go. Let's go play in a room. Oh, let's call it the Bald Eagles this week. Let's call <laughs> yeah. it that. You know, let's call it this. But during that time, he did have a band that he wanted to call the Chromags. Um, and they were one of the bands that went by the wayside. And, and, and it's not like, and they actually played one gig. It was called, they, and they, but they didn't play as Chromags. They played as Disco Snoopy for some reason. And uh, it, was, it was John Barry from the Beastie Boys singing. Dave Stein, I think from Artless. Dave Hahn, maybe? I don't know. And Harley played bass. Yeah. And I went to the gig with Harley because we were we had already started, you know, we we were already a band. We were this other band. We weren't right. We, you know, we were bald eagles or whatever we were gonna be. <laughs> and I saw the show and I liked the songs. I thought they were good. Not a single song from that band ended up being a chromex song. Okay. So it's not like you know, like this whole mythical story he tells about like I had this band I, and I demoed the songs before I ever met Paris. Not true. He had that band. It went by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point, John Joseph was involved with that band. That's why John always says he was an original member. Right. Because that <laughs> band was not the Chromex, but they had that name. So we you. started this other band with my songs. So what's more Chromex? The songs that are on Age of Quarrel or that band that played 
at Dis- you know, Disco Smoothie or the guy who wrote the song he, he sang for for a minute. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's funny <laughs> to think about it in these increments, but you know, we were writing these songs. That band went by the wayside. He was playing, probably was playing drums with Murphy's Law. And then he, then him and John Joseph and Doug Holland started another band. Mode While of ignorance. we were writing songs called yeah. the called Mode of Ignorance, right? Right. And so that was a whole other band. And you know, that was that was Harley again trying to create his dream of a skinhead band. Right. But as my songs were developing and developing, and it became clear that that skinhead dream of his wasn't going to take off. He came back to this, but during that period of time when all these songs were being written, his former manager from the Stimulators um, got the idea to uh, that he wanted to manage Harley, and he wanted he think he thought Harley should be a star and he should make a, a solo record. So he paid for a recording studio, and Harley went into the studio and recorded uh, five songs that I never heard. Because he wasn't contributing any songs to the Chromex at that time, we weren't even right. called the Chromex. So they were—that was all you. The, those first few songs, you know, hard, hard yeah. times, life of my mm-hmm. own. It's and he took his piece. songs and he recorded the solo album, which yeah. was going to be called Ten Inches of Harley. It was supposed to be on a ten inch called Ten Inches of Harley. Like that was the pretty joke. Good. And so, <laughs> That's pretty good. He recorded. I remember when he was recording, and I remember feeling kind of like. Why don't we just record a record ourselves? He said, "Because this is a solo record. This is this is a totally different thing." Yeah, you know. You, and, and as a kid, you know, whatever. It was just like, okay, fine, whatever. And uh, I, and uh, I guess I was a little insulted that I didn't get to play on it or anything. And then I heard it. He had a cassette of it. He played it for me, and there was like, you know, two half baked songs and mm. two okay songs, and or one really good song, and. Uh, <laughs> And then, and then the, 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 you know, then this guy, the manager guy, yeah, you know, basically held the tapes for hostage to get Harley to sign a management contract, ah. and he wouldn't do it, and so that record never came out, and really? so it just basically got shelved. And I remember at that point, you know, I had heard the tape a bunch of times, and I said to him, I was like, why don't we play this one song? This one song is good. It was called "Don't Tread on Me." Oh. And I said, I said, this song is great. Why don't we play? He's like, no, that's for my solo record. That's a whole separate thing. And I'm like, okay, fine. But as time went on, we got closer and closer to the point where we were going to play play gigs and stuff. So I was like, we need more songs. We need more songs. Okay. So he finally agreed to add uh, Don't Tread on Me. And there was another song on there. I forget what it was called. I think it was called Dead End Kicks or something. And John, I think by that point, John changed the lyrics and it became Do Unto Others. So oh. from that from that solo record that he did, which now he's trying to pawn off this demo for Chrome Mags that he, that he made oh. before me, we only used two songs from that: "Don't Tread on Me" and "Do Unto Others." And "Do Unto Others," I never really liked that song. Mm. But uh, those were the only two, and they came way after the fact, way after we were banned. Wow! And they were only in, incorporated into the Chrome Mags set once he abandoned all these other, you know, like when he was having aspirations for it. Hmm. Very interesting. It, it sounds very convoluted, but it's like that's typical of the, the way those guys operate. They'll just take a thread of truth and they'll just backdate something. Like, you know, I think Harley put out some kind of history of the band on the web that I, on Wikipedia or whatever that I can't even bother to like chase these things down where he says he met me in 1983. Now he can put them, uh, you know, like he talks about Eric Casanova and starting the band and having this vision and stuff like that. But we started the band in like 1981 or 1980. All right. You know, so what he does is he just erases me from the from the whole beginning. Which what is the what is that? What good does that do? Well, like I said, how because he, he can't go forward in an honest way mm. by excluding me by excluding me Nobody unless can. he excludes me from the history. Right. So he's, what he's trying to do is rewrite the history so he can paint himself as like this guy who had this vision from the very beginning, which is completely untrue mm. because his vision certainly didn't take into account my dominant songs on the album. And the fact that I had a vision to start a band at the exact same time, he's the one who answered my, my ad in effect. Right. Why didn't things work out with Eric considering, I mean, the, the lyrics that he contributed to the record are timeless. Yeah, was his was his vocal delivery not as good, or was he just not into it? 
Yeah, he said no, he bowed it, out. It wasn't, it wasn't any of those things. Eric was 15 years old. <laughs> and he was just our crazy wild friend on the street. And, you know, we just grabbed him and said, you're going to be the singer. And he's like, yeah, fuck yeah. And he didn't know what he was doing. He had no idea. Yeah. Which, you know, like I said, you know, everybody was just flying by the seat of their pants. Mm. But, uh, you know, he took his little school notebook and he scrawled out you know, some titles of songs some on top shit. of the page. <laughs> and, and again, you know, he didn't, he, he never wrote a song before. So what he did was he looked around, you know, and he said to himself, oh, Run DMC, Run DMC is cool. They had a song called Hard Times. So he wrote the words Hard Times on the top of the page. And then he was like, oh, a big hip hop song at the time, Street Justice. Whoa. So he wrote Street Justice at the top of the page. And then wow. he just started writing his own lyrics. Because he needed a place to start. Mm. You know what I mean? So he didn't steal those songs. He just took the titles and then wrote his own songs. Survival of the Streets. Bob Marley. Survival. Wow. He put the word wow. survival at the top of the page and then he just wrote his own lyrics. You know, and so we, you know, he didn't have a phone. His parents didn't have a phone. He lived way out in Queens. I'd never been to his house. And we were, we had been rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. And uh, we finally got Mackie in the band. So it was like me, Mackie. Harley and, and John finally, after like so many changes, I played bass at first and Harley played drums at first. And we went through a, a, a parade of knuckle, knuckleheads coming and going. And then we, this, we finally had this lineup and we, we had been rehearsing. And I guess I felt like uh, we were ready to play a gig. So I went and booked a gig at CBGB's. And, uh, and then Eric just disappeared. Oh, wow. Which I guess wouldn't have been that unusual. People, you know, back then would just not show up or whatever. But we always all met at CBGB's or we all met at the park in and we all met in the park or something. But Eric just wasn't around and we booked this kid. And uh, and it was just that that kind of thing where he was just uh, just a guy, uh, n- just not being accountable. And then sure. and then yeah. and then John Joseph's presence uh, on the scene had become this, this like, you know, him pushing Harry Krishna on everybody. Mm. And. Oddly enough, one of the pe- first people that he enlisted was, was Eric. And I remember when it was happening, like I remember walking down the street. It was like this thing that you would suddenly see beads appear on somebody's neck. Yeah. And they had this like, uh, they had this whole like uh, method of like slowly indoctrinating people by uh, telling them a little bit about it, like no pressure type thing. And then, like a gift, how oh, have these beads? And then when you put the beads on, they say, uh, now that you have these beads, you you know, and you've been told all these things, now you're aware of Krishna. So you went through life before, now never being aware of it, but now you are Krishna conscious. And they're like, yeah, but I'm not a Krishna. Like, no, no, you're not. But you're not one of us, but you are Krishna conscious now. So it it so what they did was get these kids to start referring to themselves as Krishna conscious. So these kids would come down to a show and they'd have the beads and someone would be like. You weren't Krishna be- beads, and they go, "Well, I'm not a Krishna. I'm just aware." And now you are too. They're Krishna something. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like uh, they're referring to themselves that way. And yeah. this, this is like a a real brainwashing technique that they use. You know, they they, they study this kind of thing in all kinds of cults. To, you know, to to slowly convert people. But anyway, I saw Eric standing on the street, and he was wearing these beads, and he, he did that whole routine on Krishna conscious now. And that's where I started picking up on this thing. You say. And I just remember saying to him, you know, Eric, you're like a prime candidate for these kind of people. You know, they, they enlist people who don't, don't have a good family life and don't have any education yeah. and, and are hungry. And and, uh, and they just, they tell you all the things that you want to hear. And I think that was probably the big, the, a big wedge between me and him, because I guess he just really needed it or needed something. And uh, then one day he just showed up and he was like, I'm moving into the Hare Krishna temple. Yeah. And he also had this, like, he was like 15 years old and he had a 25 year old girlfriend who got pregnant. And uh, we were talking about doing shows and, and we were going to do some touring. And he was like, yeah, I'm going to bring my girlfriend and the baby on tour. I was like, <laughs> and it was just this whole thing of like him living in the temple, wanting to bring his 25 year old girlfriend and his baby on, on the road in these, you know, these van tours, <laughs> which we anticipated doing because that was way before we got signed or anything. Yeah. And it just, it just became untenable for us and uh it wasn't like an ugly thing it was just kind of like we're gonna, gonna work. do something yeah, else right, and he was right. already immersed in doing the harry christian thing so he felt like he had found something that was more important anyway. 
So of all the guys to replace him with, you get the guy that recruited him. Yeah, but the thing is, like, I wasn't even, I wasn't even, you know, there's no way to understand what was going on because it wasn't like he was really, John was really open about it. You know, sure. I've, I've said to many people that it was like a big bait and switch because when I met him, he just appeared to me to be like a tattooed, you know, hardcore, tough guy, wannabe type guy. And, uh, and perfect for a, a hardcore frontman. I mean, we, then time has shown that that was absolutely the case. I mean, his his presence yeah. as a vocalist is like, okay, you can see why this is the yeah. guy. I, I, I wanted him more than Harley did. Harley was 100% against it because of his because he was a Harry Christian. And, uh, but I didn't really see it because he never pushed it on me. You know, I guess, you know, those guys are trained to, to know who to target and who not to target, who not to waste their time with. So when I when we brought him into the band, I didn't I couldn't have imagined ever in my wildest dreams that this would have become an influence on the band. Like how could nah. like how could something so stupid affect my band? Like I just couldn't even imagine it. But what I didn't see was behind the scenes he was slowly recruiting Harley. Mm -hmm. And then at some point once he had uh Harley completely committed, that's when he began to voice you know, to try to flex his power in the band. And what he did was he told Harley, it was me, you got, me and you, we're basically missionaries. We're going to change the world. And Paris is getting in the way. So whenever I had a conflict with John, he would put Harley in between us. Oh. And, and, that's, and, and, that's, and that's how it slowly happened. So it really felt like a big switch. It was well, not, not, I definitely, I certainly never, ever decided to have a Harry Christian singer. To me, he just seemed like a hard person. So that that's a pretty good segue to get into best wishes, which have I mean the only one is about Krishna, is it not? Yeah, you know when when, when that song was coming together, John had already been pushed out. Which you said, and I quote: "By the time it came to record best wishes, his singing hadn't improved, so we ditched him." That is a hundred percent true, but there were so many other things that that made it more urgent. You know, if we had all been friends, I certainly would have worked harder with him. No, I see. If he had been, if we had been friends, he would have been open for me to work harder with him. Uh, like I did on first record. Um, but it, there had become this, by that time, there had become this serious divide in the band where it was basically John, Doug and Harley against me. It was like 50, 50 vote. I had 50, they had 50 between three you know, whenever we had a fight uh but um so yeah by the time we got to the best wishes thing with the song the only one was the result of you know diplomacy you know mm -hmm. harley at that point he had just become so immersed in this harry christian stuff that he wanted to sing about it. and i being somewhere in between wanted to dissuade that, but also cater to his needs. And I said, as an artist, you don't have to come out and say the words, mm -hmm. you know, a real artist tells a story and lets people take from it what the story is. You don't have to force feed people. That's the art. But anyway, ultimately the, um, the song, the only one became, him taking my advice and taking the artful approach to telling his religious story. Wow. And, it, and, it, and what, we, and what ended up happening was it became masked as a love song, but it's actually a devotion song. Yeah. I've yeah. always interpreted it as a love song. Well, what's funny is I, I saw <laughs> Harley and the cro play not too long ago and they played that song and he, he says this used to mean a bunch of different things. Now nah, I think, I, I think it's just going to be about my wife. <laughs> and like, that's how he kind of intros it. I do have a question about crush the demoniac. Oh, crush the demoniac. John's yeah. version of, of the band had, has been playing that. And, and he would say something. I, I, I saw it a couple times that like that song was written when he was still in the band or some, something like that's that. True. I, Okay. So was that, was that written for age of coral or after, and just while he was still involved? It, it was written after it, it was, yeah, that's a good question. I wonder why that song, maybe we just hadn't finished it yet. Cause 
when Doug Holland joined the band, which was really, really soon before we recorded Age of Quarrel. Like he joined like, you know, the zero hour, the eleventh hour. And, so did he did um, he write anything on Age of Quarrel? Yeah, he wrote that that main riff. Oh, really? And that was like kind of an intro to the band, and uh, and then uh, and then I wrote Dan and Dan and talk about another song. It's like another like there was this ACDC song on uh, Back in Black. God, I haven't listened to Back in Black in so many times, so many years, but I think it's on the second side. It goes Dan and Dan. Yeah, 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 so yeah. So I just played it really fast. It's basically the same riff, just played super fast. Do you know if, did Doug get the verse riff from uh, Aces High, the Iron Maiden song? See, I never heard Aces High. Okay. I never heard Iron Maiden. I had no idea who they were. And the funny thing was, Best Wishes came out. Nobody said anything about it. Years and years went by. I don't think I heard anything about it until like the mid 90s, maybe even later than that. And when I heard it, when I heard somebody tell me that, I was so surprised that I'd never heard it before. Because I, I, mm-hmm. you know, I never listened. I never listened. I'm in, in my life except for like in bars and you know, run for the hills. Come on, that's a banger. <laughs> but I, but I never. I, I don't like Iron Maiden. I, uh-huh. To me, they're they're kind of like uh, all the things about metal that I don't like. Ah, um, interesting. In one ba- in one band. So when I heard that we recorded a riff that was a direct rip off of them, I was kind of humiliated and I was <laughs> mad at Doug for a long time. And, uh, and it wasn't until recently that I spoke with Doug. Doug's a very peculiar character. And, uh, he, he said to me, he goes, he goes, you know, how, what a, how, what a riff thief Harley is. And I go, yeah. He goes, that was the first song I wrote with you guys. And the last pretty much. And I'm like, yeah, pretty much. And he goes, I was just testing the waters. I just figured if I was going to throw a riff out there, it was going to be like a, like a, like a red herring. Wow. And I was like, are you kidding me? He goes, no. He goes, and he goes, and I was right. Wow. wow. And I was like. He poisoned <laughs> the well. <laughs> and I just looked at him and I said, you're kind of a genius. Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's diabolical. <laughs> I wish yeah. I had done that. Yeah. Oh, my wow. God. Like, I can't tell you. I mean, when he said that to me, he was like, you know what a riff thief is. It's like, I mean, you know, the entire time I was in the band, I would like, you know, he would just suddenly, you know, what he would do is I would go and show him a song. And then go around the neighborhood, which was the, the whole scene. And he would play them tapes. He'd play people tapes, like everybody, you know, yeah. like guys in Gnostic Front. You know, anybody of note. And he'd be like, oh, listen to this new, my new song. My new song, my new song. My, and he wouldn't even say he wrote it. He'd just say my new song over and over and over and over again. So it became common knowledge that he'd written all these songs that I wrote. And I guess uh, Doug was, was, was uh, savvy to that already. And, I, and I, again, I, I forgot why it came up. I think because I mentioned it in, in an article. And, uh-huh. and Doug contacted me. And he didn't even contact me like angry. He, he contacted me very matter of fact. And he explained the whole thing to me. And I was like, wow. Wow. Brilliant. Interesting. Are you guys still so in contact I, at all? No, I mean, not really. It's not like we're not in contact. It's just, you know, we don't have a kind of daily, day-to-day kind of thing, but he'll, he'll reach out to me from time to time. Interesting. But it kind of bothers me because, you know, the riffs that I really like that I wrote in that song, I feel like I wasted now. Wow. Nope, nobody's actively like, I'm not going to listen to that because it's got 15 <laughs> seconds of an Iron Maiden song. Yeah, right. I don't right, think right. that. You know, there's a Motorhead song that has the same riff in it, too. There you go. See, here's the thing. Everything comes from somewhere. That's right. Yes. I mean, it's like when we put, you know, it's like when, uh, you know, the song Show Me No Mercy, uh, it was out on the demo and then uh, a Suicidal Tendencies album came out, you know, war with a song called War Inside My Head. Same. I remember everybody saying, like, doesn't that piss you off? And I go, you know, it's, we're influenced by the same things, you know, I, you know, sometimes that happens. We we cross we cross paths. It's synchronicities to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, I never and I love suicidal. So I mean, I didn't like them at that time. Two two great songs. It takes two to <laughs> tango. You know. Well, yeah. and you clearly love fret seven on A, and then just play dancing around that. And yeah, 
Yeah. And probably the best example of it, of like, here's every version of this monochromatic riff in death camps. And just from like start to finish was that, that song to start a record is like really, for lack of a better term, because I hate the word, it's very epic as a way to like start a record, you know, um, would just love to know where, because there are so many like, there's there's the longer ending with like a, an extra guitar solo and like lots of stuff where it just kind of keeps going. Was that your, your brainchild? Was that your riff? Or was that? No, I mean, my, that song was do- dominant by Harlan. Cool. I have riffs in there, but it, it, sure. that was definitely dominant by him. He was, I remember at the time saying he wanted to like imitate Anthrax, mm. which I didn't even know what Anthrax, wow. who, who Anthrax was at the time. But the, <laughs> the, the way the album starts was quarter of the day. You know, the only time a drummer got a writing credit on the Chromex album which was P.D. Hines because he came up with that opening. And oh. then, uh, you know, he started playing that opening and then I started playing, Dan and then. So that's mine, and uh, and then you know, throughout the song, it, it's mostly Harley, but uh, I got my lips in you. Fantastic, Age of Quarrel. The song on yes. that is a is a top five. That might be the single hardest Chromag song pre. I don't, don't want to talk about. I don't want to talk about <laughs> Alpha Omega because I don't know if that's uh Well, I, we can. We can. I mean, we can talk about anything. There's nothing I won't talk about. It's just you know. Like your riffs are used on that record. A lot of them, yeah. A lot. Wow. I mean, okay. not so, not even not, you, won't, you can't even say a lot of riffs. Songs, entire songs. The, the 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 majority of the album was written by myself and this guy named Rob Buckley, who came in to replace Doug Holland. Gotcha. And Rob was like, you know, 18, 18 years old, on fire, and uh, and Harley was like. Out in Harry Krishna, pot smoking land, and uh, dealing pot in Central Park, and uh, and he was just he he just become such a he become very nobody was welcome. So even though Rob was in the band, he just was didn't want to have anything to do with him. Really. So me and Rob just spent um like I'd say an entire winter and summer writing all those songs like in their entireties, and uh, and we would always invite Harley to come down. But he would he would say no. He would just and, and I remember at some point him saying to me like, I don't know why you're bothering with all that music. I've got an entire album written, and it's going to change. It's going to revolutionize music. But there was no songs written. <laughs> so when it came so when it came time to make demos, which we did, we uh, went into this little studio called West Bet Studio from the West Side of Manhattan, and we demoed all the songs that we that me and Rob had written, all of them, like every, you know, all those songs. So Apocalypse Now was a, was a Paris? Apocalypse Now was actually written before Rob was in the band. Wow. That was a song that we probably wrote. It was written during the Best Wishes era. Interesting. But, wow. uh, but, but, but every other song was written that year with me and Rob, except for Other Side of Madness, which was okay. a song I wrote it's a great song. during the Best Wishes era, God. which never got recorded and just went by the wayside. And so anyway, we, we demoed all this stuff for Alpha Omega and uh, we decided to do a little tour to test out the material. And it was just such a shit show Like Harley refused to play the new songs. I was like, the whole point of us doing this tour is to play the new songs. The only one to play songs from Major Quarrel is like all insecure, like you know, just having to cater to his ego at the time. It's like I always liken it. So like, no, dear, you don't look fat in that dress. <laughs> OK, we'll play the we'll play the Age of Quarrel songs. But, you know, the whole point was to go out and play these songs. And just he was just such a dick on that tour that by the time we finished the two week tour, mm-hmm. me and Rob decided to quit wow. and, and wow. start our own band. We had just written an entire album together. Like, why, should, why are we putting up with this fucking dickhead when we've just written a whole great album worth of music? So we quit. Pardon this interruption. We've got to take a break from the insanity of this unbelievable episode to talk to you about the people bringing you this episode, the people that made these insane stories possible. Mm. The, the story is so insane. There's one coming up about Jorge going for a run that made me just go for a run, which is why I'm sitting here drenched in sweat, <laughs> covered in sweat. But have you drank your AG one today? 
How do you think I got through that thing? <laughs> How do you think I have the energy to go about my day mm. and to feel like I have the necessary amount of vitamins, antioxidants, and probiotics? <sighs> it's all AG1. It's all It's AG1. a one scoop and 16 ounces of water, and it gives you the daily vitamins that you're missing, you know? And you know you're missing them. You know you're missing them. Stop I know lying. what you, the listener and viewer of this show, eats like. Mm. The, the AG1 that you're drinking will make you feel like John Joseph in his prime. <laughs> Listen, I got a whole sack full of Wingstop over there, and I'm going to balance it out with some delicious AG1 afterwards. See? Chromags were handing out pamphlets about vegetarianism. We're handing out pamphlets about AG1. So go to athleticgreens.com slash hardlore, and you get five free travel packs and a year supply of vitamin D. It's also Manscaped time, bro. Oh, oh my God. Is it ever? I can't wait to man go upstairs and manscape after that run I just went on. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what I used today? I cracked open a brand new bottle of the body wash. It's a delight. Yours is on the way, by the way. It smells so good. It, it smells, smells so everywhere good. Everywhere you go, somebody goes, that smells incredible. What? Who are you wearing? And you go, <laughs> man, I'm scaped. <laughs> Period. If you're a master killer, you manscape. Those those are the rules. That's you know? how it goes. Yep. You can't be going around smelling and looking like a Neanderthal. No, smell good, trim good, look, feel good. You That's know. That's right. Master kill the opposition <laughs> with your with manscape. You know. <laughs> yeah. The what do they? Stinky people need to be put in their place. <laughs> <laughs> what do they get if they use code Hardlore? If you use code Hardlore, you get twenty percent off and free shipping. Hello. One of the greatest deals of all time. <laughs> They'll, they're going to be talking about it for years. For years. They'll be like, can you believe that they offer 20% off and free shipping on Manscaped for that long? Because they're the longest running hardware partner. I'm sweating profusely. If you can see it. It's just unbelievable. Well, this is a good time for you to go and enjoy all the products that Manscaped has. I can't wait to do that. And before mm. I do that, the only thing that's going to stop me from sweating for real is if all of you go to hardlorepod.com and check out our brand new store. Oh my God. Say that Isn't again, that Colin. Say it again. <laughs> the only thing that'll stop me from sweating <laughs> is if all of you go to hardlorepod.com and check out our new store. <laughs> enjoy the rest of this episode. Did you plan to quit and take those songs with you? Of course. They're yeah. our songs. They're your so songs, what happened yeah. there? Um, we didn't, you know, there was no internet, there was no connection. There was like, you know, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And Harley went off and like found Doug, found John Joseph, made a deal for a made a record deal with uh, Century Media. And, you know, I didn't know it was a race. I, didn't, I couldn't imagine in my wildest dreams that somebody would record our songs. Yeah. Right. Especially since the whole time he was telling us how terrible they were and how he had a whole album written. Mm. So he went into the studio and he basically took every demo and everything that every riff that he ever heard that I wrote and recorded them. And that's why there was all those extra riffs to, to make that other near death experience album. But I remember going to like when, while they were recording, I remember seeing Gabby Bularaj, the guy who yeah. played guitar on that album because he was a friend he's, with my friend Marco. I, I mean, he's I didn't a riffer. Know him. I, I knew yeah. his brother, Marco. Mm. And I saw him and I went up to him and I was like, man, you know, because I assume he didn't know. I just, you know, to me, I just assumed that everybody carries the same moral compass that I do. The, right. Especially if you're an artist. So I thought if he knew, he wouldn't be a part of it. So I went up to him and I basically told him the whole story. It's like me and this guy, Rob Buckley, wrote this album. We wrote all these songs. And so even then standing there face to face with him, I could see he was struggling with this idea of, well, now it's just Harley's word against theirs. Mm. And which is something I can completely understand. And I said, but are there any other songs that you guys are recording that are not from that one demo? Because he was explaining to me how like he learned all these songs off this demo that me and Rob made. And I said, I'm just curious, like there's a bunch of riffs that I have that weren't on that demo, like, and I hummed him the 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 riffs to other side of madness. Na, 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 ba, 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 ba. So is, is there one that goes dang and eh, yeah. Yeah. And he goes, he goes, yeah, why? Uh. He goes, how do you know that riff? I go, what do you mean? I said, I wrote it. I'm telling you, I wrote it. He goes, and he just sits, stood there and he goes, mm, now I know you're telling the truth. Uh oh, I go, why? He goes, because we had, we, we, we had all the songs that were going to be for the album. 
But about a week ago, Harley came to me and said, I just wrote a new song. And he showed me that. And I said, well, if he just wrote it, how did he Right. Because I hadn't been involved with them for like a year. Wow. And he goes, wow. and that's when he looked at me. He goes, he goes, oh, shit. Now I know you're telling the truth. He goes, before when you were just talking about this demo, you could say you wrote it. He could say he wrote it. Yeah. I mean, even though, you know, all you have to do is do the math. I mean, you as a guitar player know that Harley didn't write those all those harmonic yeah. minor metal. I mean, riffs. those yeah. riffs are insane to the point the where I like, I, 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 if if I was in Harley's situation, I would think in that moment these aren't even stealable. These are insane. But what he did was he found right. a competent guitar player like Gabby and yeah, handed them a demo. Yeah. He handed him the demo and said, "Learn these songs." Even Gabby told me that day when we talked. I said, "What about the solos? Even the solos." Gabby plays all of Rob's solos off that, off that, off of the demo. And I said, well, why would you do that? He goes, well, Harley said that he hummed the solos to, to Rob. <laughs> I just started laughing. <laughs> and uh, yeah. So at, at that moment, I thought that I had convinced Gabby again, because I, you know, I think to myself, you know, my moral, you know, that's a mistake a lot of young people make is yeah. you assume that everything that you think and believe in other people do that's why people get robbed and cheated it <laughs> sucker born every minute. Um, but I, I really thought I had, um, uh, that I, it, with that, without even intending it that way, you know, yeah. by humming him, the, 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 that the riff to the other side of madness that, uh, you could see the, Oh shit come over his face. Cause Harley is a liar. Right. So it wasn't enough that he just said, he didn't just bring the song and say, I wrote this, let's play the song. He had to throw a lie on top. I just wrote it last week. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because that's what liars do. They build, they, they give too much detail. They give more detail than is necessary. But all he had to do was walk in and tell Gabby that he wrote the song and it would have been a song. But why did he have to say he just wrote it last week? Did, you know, did it you was, too, he just went back and listened to old demos yeah. of us when we were making uh, best, uh, best Wishes. Like I even have the demo that I'm sure he played him. It's like it was a cassette. We used to like make cassettes of rehearsals and dupe them and give them to so each other. Those are gone. What's that? Are those long gone, or do you do you still have them? The oh, I actually have those the master tapes of those demos, but you know, wow, I have no reason to ever. We'll put them out. Cardboard Records <laughs> coming soon. Yeah. Every song on that record was written by me and Rob, exactly. except uh, Apocalypse Now, which was written prior to Rob being in the band, and the other side of Madness which all the riffs up until like there's like a right in the middle, it just kind of like stops and then restarts with like a riff. That's kind of like the other riffs. It was something I hardly would always do to like try to get writing credits on my songs. He would like mm. stick in one little part. So what he basically did was like took my riffs and that whole thing that was, he took and they, he played cycle through it a couple of times. I, I haven't heard the song since it came out. And then all of a sudden he writes a riff that sounds kind of like my riff. And then it goes into that whole piano part. Yeah. And from that point on is whatever they came up with in the Just studio. To get some everything points. before that I wrote. Yeah. So Eyes of Tomorrow, was that written to be kind See, of I don't, like, I don't recognize those titles. That's it's the uh, one. Uh, it's. Go ahead. Get, get it, get it, get out, get out, and goddamn, I love to ring it in my head. Wake up. It's word. kind of a hip hop. I wouldn't recognize the words. <laughs> uh, yeah, really syncopated with a fast part. Oh, wait a Very hip hop sounding. This is like this. There we go. This is all I've ever wanted. Zoom's no, it up. that's that's the that's that's like the first song. Yeah, let's see the signs. Mm -hmm. So legally, were there were there ramifications from that? Well, this is this is a terrible lesson to learn, but and it's also a terrible thing to say on a public broad podcast because I, you know, I always feel like when you watch crime shows, you're basically just teaching criminals how to steal. But um, uh, when when Alpha Omega came out, and then I heard it, and I heard all this music. I mean, it was devastating. You know, when you, when you write an album, it's like, it's like you empty yourself. You know, I, I always say that it's like you empty your pockets on the table, like you give everything you have for like a year 
And you know, just basically milk blood from a stone, you know, creating creating all this music. And and then what what ends up happening is you take that music and you record it, which takes like whatever. And a year later, the album comes out, and then you tour on it for like a year. So the the that music represents like years of your life, like yeah, you know. And obviously, they've been touring on that music for decades. But the the, the, the problem what was when that music was stolen it just leaves you empty and yeah. it doesn't give you like that recording process and touring process to build up all those juices again, to, to fire them off. And so you, you just, it's, it's devastating. It's a, it's a, it's, it's like a death blow. It really was, it was a terrible, terrible, horrible thing. Yeah. And, um, and there was nobody to tell and nobody who would listen, you know, like it's like with the music business, like I explained earlier, you're either on the inside or you're on the outside. And when they put out Alpha Mega, that those people, whoever they were, were on the inside with my music. And I was on the outside without a voice, without a voice of the press. There was no internet back then. There was yeah. nobody to tell. So they basically, so basically my only recourse was to was legal and uh, of course i copywrote and published all those songs right you know because that's just normal what you do and uh i went to a lawyer an entertainment lawyer and I sat down with him and he basically listened to everything i explained and i said all the songs are copywritten and published you know it's all protected you know what what do we do and he said so you he goes is the album successful i go what do you mean he goes have they sold a million copies i said no he goes, so you want to sue on moral grounds? I said, I, I, what do you mean? Yes. Yeah. He goes, well, there's no money to be made. If your friend, and he kept referring to Harley as my friend. He goes, if your yeah. friend doesn't sell a million records, there's no money to get. So how are you going to pay me? Because <laughs> usually I would take a job. I would take, I would take a job on contingency. So you wouldn't have to be out of your pocket. But wow. there's no, there's nothing, there's no contingency here. There's no, there's no mm. end of the line. So if you want to sue uh, and fight them on moral grounds, you'll have to pay me to do that, and it's going to cost a lot, a lot of money. Mm. And I, and and so basically, I learned this lesson. You know, anybody can steal anybody's song and get away with it, because the only way to not get away with it. <laughs> is to have somebody come after you legally and nobody can afford that. So it's only like when, you know, big, these big artists like Taylor Swift lift a, lift a song that, that lawsuits happen, but, you know, be careful with your music, all you people out there. And, you know, if you're rehearsing in a rehearsal studio and uh, somebody records you out in the hallway and just takes your song, even if you copyright it, it doesn't matter. If there's no money to be made. It's a real <laughs> terrible thing. So yeah. that's what happened uh, with Alpha Mega. And that you know, and then I started hearing other side of madness on the radio. You know, this, oh it my started god, being played on the radio, and I was like, you know, you know, you know, the, the, every you know, like I, you know, we talk about writing songs and picking up your guitar and just playing and playing and playing and playing until you find something. And you find something that nobody else found before. Yeah, you know, what I mean, that's what makes an artist that's is being able to discern is being able to dis discern the difference between million other combinations of those seven notes and the ones yeah. that you stumbled upon that move people. And even when you have the ability to do that, you don't only get so many in life. You know, in my life, I've only made four albums. You know, that may seem a lot to somebody else, but to me, it doesn't seem like a lot at all. So mm. you think you'd have millions of riffs. Like you think, you know, John Lennon had millions of riffs, but he didn't. He only has, you only have a certain amount over a certain amount of years. And you're deeply attached to every single one of them, like Phantom Limbs. Those songs on on Alpha Omega, I've had to like turn my brain off of. And it was a tra it was a trauma that I don't know if I've ever gotten over. I mean, wow. to a large extent, it it changed my it rewired my brain. It, it rewired my self confidence. It rewired my my faith in myself. Uh, it, it was it was just a terrible terrible experience, and in, 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 in to a large extent, it brought me down you know in a way that even allowed me to go back and make the next Chromax album because I I guess I so desperately 
wanted to take something back. You know what I mean? I wanted somehow to get back what was taken to me, taken from me. Because, you know, like I spent all that, those youthful years deciding I was going to make a band, for yeah. making the music, the, the, the main chunk of the music that made this music that moved people and that created uh, a legacy that somebody should be able to ride on for the rest of their life as a musician. I'm, of course, continuing to make music, but it creates yeah. a foundation for a musical life. That was just taken from me. So a lot of people say, I can't believe you went back and did Revenge. But I think it was because I was so psychologically beaten down and I just felt like I needed to get a handle on that legacy again. But I tell you, it wasn't until we were in the studio making Revenge, recording the songs, 90% of the songs that I wrote, and I, and and a bunch of the songs Harley didn't even know how to play because it was another one of those things where like I don't even like your songs. So I would go in, you know, but we had to record. So me and the drummer go in and we record basic tracks on songs like "Tore Up," you know, just the two of us. A song that I completely wrote and mapped out, note for note, every single note, beginning to end, the entire arrangement. And when we finished the take, the take of that astronomically hard song, like a great drummer like Dave uh, had a very, you know, I won't say it struggled, but I, physically struggled. You know, it's yeah. a challenge. You know, he's like an athlete, you know, playing that song. When we finally had that take in the can and I listened back to it, I was, and there was no bass on it. It was just me and Dave. I didn't have to come here to do this. Right. Like it, this could have been anything. I see. This could have been my, you know, my yeah. record coming back by myself, but I got sucked into this whole thing. And, I, and at that point, I was just like, okay, let's just ride it out. And of course, it, it turned bad quickly. And that then the band broke up again. And uh, and I just went, went off in a different creative direction and started working yeah. in the film business. But my brain got rewired again a little bit. Like trauma and experience has that effect on you. It, it rewires the way your neural pathways send confidence or, or self-doubt, or right. joy, depression, mm-hmm. all those things. You, you can rewire, you, your brain gets rewired by, by, by circumstance. And so over those years of having a very successful career in the music business, I think, you know, I, I, had, I had two egos that have been compartmentalized, you know, that, that, that beaten down, Mm. uh, musical ego. And then my filmmaking ego, and I just become very successful. And I found myself in this situation where I was just, uh, very gratified and, uh, had a great creative space in my life and found myself playing music again. And that's when, you know, this, all this happened, Yeah, of course. you know, and, 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 and I not only, found myself back in that studio with Dave DiCenzo recording tore up, you know, intellectually, uh, I found myself saying, well, you know, I'm, you know, I need need Dave. I'll just map out all these songs to clicks and fill in all the blanks and make the songs the way I always did, you Mm -hmm. know, because when you're younger, I I don't even know if it has anything to do with use. I I think it just has to do with historic, just, Historically, bands are bands. You know, you always, you know, you yeah. pick up a magazine and there's four guys standing there and you think that's where the music comes from. Right. Of but course. as Bo said, it's really, you know, to to a large extent, it's the it's the songwriter, the one who is uh guiding the musical force. And if that person goes and those other guys go, well, I'm playing those songs forever, it just it, it doesn't make any sense to any, anybody who understands where the music actually comes from. Correct. But uh but I, I wanted. I just felt like I needed to do this record for myself. I loved the idea of being in a band. Uh, I just never been in one that I liked. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get back to Age of Quarrel. Some stuff I didn't get to ask about. What was it like when you guys were first playing shows? Like before recording Age of Quarrel, obviously John's stage presence as a frontman established himself as the right guy. Were you concerned going into recording for what that would be like? You said, quote, he had almost no musical understanding. He was just a guy in the scene who decided I'll be a singer. Well, I mean, the first part of your question was, what was it like in those earlier gigs? The, the very first few gigs was with Eric. Right. We gigged with Eric. 
And Blood Clot had already existed, right? Blood Clot certainly played before cro ever played on it. He was kind of, wasn't really on my radar. I'd seen him sing for that band, but we had already started with Eric. Okay. And we played a couple of gigs with Eric, and they were like, kind of sketchy. Like, you know, we, we weren't the finely honed machine we were down the line. So yeah, I kind of forced us up on stage at CBGB's, and it was uh, Mackie, me, and Harley, and, and and Eric, and and we played. I think we played three gigs together, and then uh, when we decided that Eric wouldn't continue with us, we got John, and uh, and again, like I said, it wasn't. <clears throat> there was no conflict at first. You know, we had we had already been in the recording studio and made the demo, the Age of Coral, the before the Coral demo, and. I guess at that stage, John was much more uh, amenable to direction. You know, I was actually in a photo in, in the vocal booth with him, <clears throat> helping him rhythmically, getting Eric's cadences. Like, oh, you better start to face reality. For some reason, John couldn't get that, so it was, I was like, literally, they're going, oh, you better start to face reality. Come on, John, <laughs> just do it like this. Oh, you better start to face reality. You know, is 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 at rudiment. I mean, I'm. I, I often say, you know, I don't want to disparage him because I think he was, you know, everything we recorded with him was great. You know, it, I mean, it's a timeless performance at the end of the day from both him and Mackie. And I love that people love it. And I, and I'm not, not arguing. I'm just talking about the humor of like some of the yeah. behind the scenes things that people don't see. Sure. But it was, he was amenable and he was in the, in, in, we got through that recording and, he, and, it, and I think that recording is great. But by the time we got into the studio, which must have been a year later to do the album, that's when that whole transition changed where when Harley had been listening to being Harry Christian, John started using him as a shield. And uh and it just be and everything at that point it just become a, a conflict. So by the time we went into the studio, he was less agreeable and he didn't take any direction. And I think the performance on that album was marginal compared to the demo. Wow. Mm. And he had a cold, you said? Yeah, right. He had a cold. He was sick. And, you know, I don't, it, it's hard for me to get into somebody's head who I don't know, but it just seemed to me that he was already struggling. And then he had the cold as an excuse. Mm. And I kept, I kept pushing and pushing for him to come back and sing it again after he wasn't sick, but he refused. He was like, that's, that's, it's great the way it is. And it wasn't, you know, and, <laughs> you know, but, and here we are all these years later and people love the album. So, you know, doesn't matter now but he, once he finished his tracks he was gone you know there wasn't a lot of time spent in the studio making a recall we were so well rehearsed by the time we went in even steve remote said you guys are like erasing each other you're playing so tight and so perfect and there was no editing back then there was no pro tools that album is us basically playing the song live and our our producer chris williamson didn't want to do it overdubs so there's like almost no overdubs on the album that's amazing it's only after i like screamed and stomped my feet that I had to do like double tracking on malfunction so I could do the string bends da, 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 or that kind of thing <sighs> and the guitar solos of course but uh it's it's essentially a live album that's I mean that's insane considering what's going on there um you've been you've been pretty critical of Mackie as a drummer and on and his performance on that record in the past do you still feel that way because I like that's a as a drummer that's a that was a big one for me. Do you still feel the same today? Yeah, but it doesn't matter what I think. You know, you know, it matters what the listener thinks. It, how we arrive there is a different story, and it shouldn't affect how people feel about the record or even about Mackie. You know, Mackie's skill and talent is is intact, no matter how we arrived at at, at what happened. But you know, it's like. It's all the psychological mumbo jumbo that happens when you're young and fighting for your place in a band. And and he wasn't immune to that either. He was very stubborn and uncooperative. And he would, you know, like that whole thing I said, like decisions weren't made for the better of the music. Well, drumming decisions weren't made for the better of the music. Some, some of the decisions were made just to say no. Interesting. Like, silly as that sounds, that definitely played a part by the time we got into the studio to make Age of Quarrel because we were all kind of at odds. You know, it was the John and Harley and Doug camp and then Mackie 
fighting for his own ground and me fighting for my own ground. And, mm. and Mackie still viewed me as in Harley's camp, you know, like, cause in the beginning it was me and Harley were like the pair. And then all yeah. of a sudden became John and Harley and me. But whenever I try to talk to him, it still viewed me as like, as, as in that camp. So whenever he said no to me, he was saying no to Harley. It's like that kind of silly stuff. And in the end, after all these years, it doesn't matter. You know, Mackie was absolutely the best choice at the time. I always say at the end of the day, Black Sabbath is not Ozzy on Instagram, sitting on a couch with a pot belly. It's Black Sabbath albums. Yeah, you know, right. It's not the Osbournes. It's it's not the TV show. It's Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, buying, you know, buying one, all that stuff. That's what, you know, the records, what we leave behind is what it is. And Mackie, is, his part in that is written in stone. And it's great. Wow. People love it. And that's all that matters. Us included. Um, yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. And the way we got there and the fact that we had to do a thousand takes. And the reason we had to do a thousand takes, it didn't, didn't, have, didn't have to do with his skill level. It had, it had to do with so many other things. It had to do with a terrible, unjoyous atmosphere. And I, I, don't, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have space in my life to, to hold uh, a grudges against somebody for something that, uh, for, especially to a person who's not that person anymore. Whoever right. Mackie is today is not that same guy that he was back then. He's just a, he's a great drummer. Uh, and I'm not the same person I was back then. <laughs> so, right, of course. I'm sure, and I'm sure, he, I'm, I very much doubt that he'd watch this, but I'm sure he's gratified to hear that you guys love that record. And oh, we, not, we love that. We love the record. We love his performance. We love him as a drummer. Um, well, the, funny, the thing is, like me and Mackie were friends before the thing. Interesting. How about he answered an ad or something? I knew him from the streets, you know, skateboarding. He, you know, I, I rode the east side ramps and he rode the west side ramps. And mm -hmm. nobody ever went from one to the other, but I would go to the west side ramps, which wasn't really allowed. But for some reason, they let me skate those ramps and uh, I became friends with Mackie there. I didn't even know he was a drummer. Mm -hmm. And then one day I walked to CBGB's and he was on stage with Frontline. And I was like, I know that guy. He was great. You know, he was, I was, wow. was, this is great. I love this. I love, I mean, I love Frontline, but you know, me at that time, I had this like mission that, you know, I was going to poach. You know, I figured there was a million yeah, bands right. seeing if you can get all a couple of people together, poach and put together, uh, you know, the puzzle pieces and make a great band. That was, that was, and, and Harley was my first puzzle piece, which was, uh, it was beneficial because he was kind of known and famous on the scene. So it made it easier to poach those other people. So we, we poached Mackie from Frontline. And then eventually we poached Doug Holland from Kraut. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, that was, that was, the, that was the plan. You know, what, you know, like, you know, Harley, you know, again, going back to Harley's saying that he had this master plan, that was my master plan. And my best, the actually the one we used. Yeah. <laughs> That sounds like the Cro-Mags to me. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was at, at the end of the Motorhead tour was when the beat was filmed. Is it that correct? In the middle of the tour. In the middle of the tour. So that's not Mackie playing drums. Oh, in the film. Yeah, that's Petey. Wow. Yeah. wow. It's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, your, your mind opens for different reasons. Once I heard that Mackie was no longer out making a living off my legacy. I guess about two years ago. I, I don't know when he quit, but uh, I remember somebody was trying to read. Somebody was reaching out to me because they wanted to put out a vinyl version of Age of Quarrel, and they were trying to get us all together. And they wanted to know if I could get Mackie's contact information. I said, "Ask John." And they said, "We did." John doesn't have any of his contact information. I said, "Really? What do you mean?" Because apparently, he stopped uh, playing with John and changed his phone number. Wow. It's funny. My brain needed. Uh, that separation or th that lack of resentment to start to see his side of the story. There was so much tension between all of us back then. And it had to come from somewhere. I never understood it. I, I just never understood why Mackie disliked me so much, considering he was in a band playing my music. Uh, but uh, I think it had to do with so many other things that I wasn't, wasn't uh, ready to understand it. In that interview, it kind of ends with you saying that you and John were on speaking terms and yeah. that you guys had a, a sit down meeting. Is that still the case? And has that happened again? No, of course it's not the case. You, you can't get in the pit with the snakes and not get bit. 
So uh, I'm, I'm at home one day and my phone rings and it's my friend Doug Crosby, who uh, <clears throat> I've known for a very, very long time. He's a UFC judge, mm-hmm. he's a stunt, oh, right. stunt man, stunt coordinator in the film business. So I run to, into him on set quite a bit. But I met him in 1989 uh, when I found out that he wrote all the lyrics to Best Wishes. That, uh, you know, when, when John was out of the band, who was the primary lyricist, and we found ourselves making Best Wishes, and we had all this music and no lyrics at all. Oh, wow. Uh, apparently, because Doug was a writer, he sat down with Harley and basically wrote all the lyrics to all those songs. Wow. And, that's how, and, and when he first told me that, I was really mad at him. I was like, Oof. you know, it wasn't until later on that it all, all, I did all the math and I started thinking to myself about all, you know, how he tells everybody he wrote my music. And, you know, he just he's just one of those people who just takes things from other people. So you had the exact same interaction on the other end with Alpha Omega years later. Yeah. But so Doug Crosby calls me up and he's like, he's like, hey, man, I got a weird phone call yesterday. I go, really? What's that? He goes, John Joseph called me and he wants to have a meeting with you. And you got to understand leading up to this, um, John and I had a pretty adversarial relationship because he loved to tell everybody how he was going to kick my ass and all this stuff. Like, I'm a, you know, people would come, you know, I used to work out at this gym called the Gladiator Gym on, on Spit Street and Avenue A. It's like this, like a, handmade gym like this puerto rican guy like welded all the machines together Whoa, it's a total yeah. part of the gym you go and you pay like five bucks to work out that's awesome that yeah, was great and I, and, <laughs> and john also worked out there and derek from uh Sepultura. oh hell yeah and i was cool. i was always think it was funny because i would be walking down the street and people would be like yo man be careful i just saw john joseph you know man you know, I don't you know. I, I'm just looking out for you. Just be careful. I was like, oh, he's probably on the way to the gym. Like, what, what gym? I go, the Gladiator Gym. We both work out there every day. <laughs> and uh, and I would go out of my way, like if I ever saw John, and you know, because I felt like no reason to have. You know, I understand why he was mad at me because I kicked him out of the band, but I had no reason to be. You know, you know, what do I? You know, he hadn't already started to do the whole, you know, doing his own version of the Chromex thing. So whenever I see him, I would go up to him and, you know, in front of all of his people, I'd go up to him and like put out my hand and shake his hand just to kind of like underline the fact that he told everybody he was going to kick my ass. You got to understand there was a bunch of these years where I was doing yeah. that all the time, going up to him in clubs and like offering to shake his hand and be like, it's okay, I get a motherfucker. <laughs> Doug says to me, yeah, John wants to have a sit down with you. And I said, why? He goes, he says he wants to apologize to you. I said, Really? He goes, yeah. He goes, I, I goes, I'll be there if you want. And I was like, okay. I said, I told him a coffee shop that I go to, Brooklyn. He's gone now. And uh, you're and a now, Brooklyn guy now, right? Yeah. Yeah, I live in Brooklyn. I live in Bed Stuy. So I, I go and I sit down in this coffee <laughs> shop. It's me and Doug, and John comes walking in. And you know, there's this there's this thing about John where he never looks you in the eye when he's talking to you, which is a very peculiar thing. But he came in and he walked in, he sat down at the table and he looked me right in the eye. And he was like, I really want to tell you, I'm sorry about how things are between us. And, uh, you know, I behaved badly towards you in public, you know, because there was this whole thing where he told people that, like, he, uh, that I ratted him out to the military because he was AWOL from the Navy SEALs and all this bullshit, which is all fiction. He was never a Navy SEAL. He was never ratted out to the military, turned himself in. So I'm sitting there looking at him and I go, I go, okay. Uh, Okay. Uh, That's interesting. And I said, well, he goes, so how do you feel? You know, how do you feel about me saying this? I said, I feel, I feel pretty good about it. I said, as a first stage. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, now you're going to have to go in public and explain how you lied about being ratted out to the military. He was like, what? I said, you're going to have to go in the press and you do interviews. And for whatever reason, you're going to say, you know, the political reasons you fabricated the story. But uh, we're not square until you've made it square with people who 
you disparage my character to in public. Uh, well, uh, you know, I was hoping we could just start from scratch. I was like, yes, but we're not on really ground. And and Doug was like, uh, uh, you know, and then and I said, anyway, what what he he's, he basically kind of agreed to to do that. And I was like, okay. And so Doug was like, okay, it seems like you guys are getting along good. I'm going to leave. So he left. And as soon as Doug left, he's like, so I was thinking, you know, it's you know, touring is one thing, but like if you have a new record out, then you can do big shows, big festivals and stuff. I'm like, uh huh. And he's like. I was wondering if you could like be interested in writing a Chromax album with me and Mackie. You know, me, you, and Mackie, we could just get in a room like we did in the old days and hash out some songs. And I looked at him and I was like, I don't know what kind of delusion you've been living in, or maybe you just have said it so many times over and over and over. But we never did that. That that was your fiction. I wrote all those songs and showed them to you. And if I was interested in doing this now, I would do it that way. I would, first of all, you know, like I wasn't saying I was doing this. I just gave him for instance. But first of all, all these chumps that you play with are gone. And then I would sign a band that would be capable of playing the music that I would write. And if I'm going to write an album an entire album's worth of music. That's an astronomical task. I'm going to need the right people, and I'm going to have to know that you're capable of taking the direction that you were not capable of taking when you made, you know, like that kind of thing. And I said, and then I said, and thirdly, we're going to have to work out some kind of agreement with the other members of Cronin's that they get a piece. We're going to have to become a corporation. Yeah. That was the biggest takeaway for me from reading that. You have to all be treated equally, yeah. um, except for songwriting. You know, songwriting is, is, is a separate thing. But like, you know, if there's merch being sold or, or something, is, we have to figure out some kind of amicable, amicable way. And we have to have an independent manager that will handle the business. You know, and I, this was just all off the top of my head. And you can just <laughs> see John was just sitting up mouth open. And uh, he was like, well, I was just hoping. I was like, no. I said, I'm, I'm certainly not saying I would do that, but all this stuff would have to be done. And you would have to be very vocal about all the things that you said about me in public. Wow. And he was like, well, you know, maybe we should give it a try. And I was like, well, I said, the only thing I could think of is that maybe I have like a track or two from the Revenge album that, that were never finished. Go into the studio with you and we could record those songs. And based on the experience that I have with you in the studio, I could use that to make a judgment. And he was like, oh, well, uh, okay, you know, we'll think about that. And I said, well, I said, but one thing I'm glad of is like, I got to tell you, you know, you and I have a mutual past. They were both very, very proud of it. And we should be proud of it. And we should also be happy when we see each other. So I'm glad if only... This leads to us not being hostile to each other in public or him not being hostile, hostile towards me. And we can have a truce. And he was like, okay, cool. And we shook hands and he left. Oh, and I also, then I said to him, I was like, I also got to tell you, you know, what you're doing playing with Mackie and going out and making a living off my songs. I don't like it. I don't yeah. condone it. I don't give you my permission. I want you to know that you're doing it against my will. I never said that to you out loud, but I, I have to say it now. Uh, I said, I understand why you do it, uh, but I don't like it. Wow. Stay in my piece. And so he left. And the first thing he did was he did some big interview in some magazine where he said, I spoke to Paris yesterday, and I just want you to know the reason why there will never be a reunion is because of him. And he says he completely understands why me and Mackie uh, are, are continuing on, and he has, and we have his blessing. Just the opposite of what you said. Yeah. So, yes, exactly. And so our relationship went right back to sneers and, 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 uh, you know, that kind of thing. And that's where it is to this day. Yeah. I mean, I, mm. yeah, it's not like I had much opportunity to see him. I live right. a very busy life and I, I run into him once in a blue moon. I couldn't even tell you the last time. And it's not like we were ever friends, you know, even when he was in the he was a friend of mine. Before we talk about some music video stuff, because some of the music videos that you worked on, directed, whatever, 
people are going to go, holy shit, when they find yeah. out, because I bet they don't know. I'd love to talk about Master Killer. Tell us about producing Master Killer, Paris. It was a, an enlightening experience for me, you know, when you're, I, I, I'm very attracted by opportunity. You know, I've often changed direction completely <laughs> in my life based on opportunity. If an opportunity presented itself, like being in the film business or being a musician or whatever. And one of those opportunities that presented itself was being a producer, which I'm, I think I'm very well suited for, uh, you know, even in, even in agros, I, I view myself as the producer primarily. Um, and I was given the opportunity by Drew Stone, who was managing um, Marauder. Who was a friend of mine at the time he was the producer on all the music videos the the film producer on all the music videos that i directed such as onyx slam biohazard shades of gray tales from the hard side after forever punishment typo negative black number one those come those come to mind so easily because a lot of them were made uh for people that were or became friends of mine like the guys in biohazard and typo negative but drew was uh you know, he was such an integral part of my life at that time. You know, we spent, I spent more time with him than anybody because we were making music videos all the time. And then uh, I had transitioned back into, you know, because of my proximity to the music business by making music videos, I got offered a record deal by Universal Music. I was up in Leo Cohen's office, who was the C CEO owner of Def Jam at the time. Jesus. And he was, you know, big six foot four Israeli guy with blue eyes. And like, outside of his office, he's like, Paris! <laughs> all these bands I signed, all of them, Green Day, lists off 10 bands of, that he just signed. He was, he was, I make millions off these bands. I talk to them. And you know what they say to me? Chromax. How important Chromax are to them. And I'm like, that's good. He goes, you know, <laughs> if you got back together, you get signed in a second. Wow. Like, well, you see the irony of this conversation, don't you, Lior? He goes, yeah. what, what, what is this irony? I, I, I said, uh, well, you know, you're the CEO of huge record company. Uh, and you're telling me that if we got back together, we'd get a record deal. He goes, so what are you saying? I said, put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. And he basically gave us, a, gave me a, 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 like a, what they call a demo deal. Wow. He said, what do you want? I said, give me some money to make a demo. And then you can decide if you want to record me. He goes, I like this idea. So, and Harley had been reaching out to me, you know, for a long time. He was like living on the streets in San Francisco. He was like a homeless guy out there. Is this mid nineties? Yeah, it was like 93, 94. Okay. Mm. Call, you know, I, I had a beeper or something. He would beat me and we would talk on the phone. He would go on and on about how he wanted to call create a carnival of bands or there would be 10 bands and he'd be in all of them and uh, we'd go on tour and we'd do festivals, but it would all be our music. And, you know, and if I would just, you know, agree to play with him again, we can make it happen and all this stuff. There was always some grand, ridiculous. And, oh, and he also wanted to start a religious cult. Which is profitable. It's a profitable field. <laughs> Probably it's a lucrative fine. endeavor. So Lear offered me this deal, and I and it's like I called up Harley, who had been really pounding me and pressuring me for almost a year, which I just kind of like blew off. I it was mostly sympathy because he was like a junkie living in the street, and like finally reached his lowest low. And again, there's me, you know, just being sympathetic, even after all the terrible things he had done me to me, being sympathetic, feeling that like maybe perhaps because he had reached so low that he had come to some kind of realization of all the terrible things he did and that he was actually sincere. And what I didn't realize was he was just doing his best imitation of a human being and he fooled me again. And uh, so we got together and we made the demos that got assigned to Polygram, which those tapes were eventually used to make uh, White Devil? Reve Revenge and White Devil, yeah. Yeah. But right. because of that whole experience, you know, Drew saw me produce the White Devil EP. Uh, he was in the studio with us because he was managing us, which was, you know, at the tail end of the music video era. Uh, and uh, me and Drew had a conflict at that time and, and, and we separated. But before that happened, he, you know, because of the experience we had making the White Devil CD, he offered me the job of producing the Marauder album. And it was just, I, I was very simple 
you know, my demands were very simple that I, you know, the money we have is very tight. I think they had what I recall, maybe $28,000. I can't remember, maybe Mm $28,000, which is not a lot of money at all. None of these guys can be in the control room. Uh, Maybe I'll let them vote one guy to sit in the control room. But like once the tracks are done, they got to leave. And I don't want to hear anything from anybody. And uh, and everybody's got to listen to what I say. Did you, were you involved in any songwriting aspects? We only had two weeks of pre-production and the only songwriting that, that I would do that I wouldn't take any credit for would be making endings to all the songs. And the opening track, uh, the first riff, there's like this harmony guitar part. Oh yeah. I was just sat in the studio with my guitar in my lap. Every time I heard this intro, it just it sounded okay, but it just didn't sound as musical as I thought it could. So I just started playing this harmony over it. Yeah. And then at some point I, I said to Anthony, I was like, I was like, I was like, play this harmony. And he heard it and was like, Oh, that sounds so great. Now you just record it. And I was like, I was like, no, uh, it's I don't want to it's not for me to to play it, it's for you to play it. And he goes, No, 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 no. So I played that little harmony. Oh, really? Thing. And uh and, and it was the same thing when we came to doing solos. Uh, Anthony, uh, he he didn't want to be there. And he was trying to leave. And it was time to do the guitar solos. And uh, he made up some elaborate story about how his girlfriend was pregnant. And he had to take her to get an abortion or some, some cockamamie horseshit. It was just like so obviously made up. And I told him, and he says, you, you play the solos. And I said, listen. He goes, you could do it. And I said, yeah, I know I can do it. But I'm not going to have you fucking hating my guts for the rest of your life because I played guitar, I played the solos on the album that you should have played the guitar solos on. And so I made him stay and we just focused on the guitar solos and uh, he listened. There were like weird things we did where he was playing certain licks that I heard him play by himself, but I couldn't hear articulated on the record. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I, and I kept, you know, you just got to problem solving. I was like, I can't hear it. I don't understand why. I turned down the distortion. Do Let's do something. And the only thing we could do was to get him to play completely clean. And then he said to me, he goes, but this isn't like death metal. I was like, we're not making a death metal album. We're making a melodic And And that started from the very beginning. Like when I went to, um, when I went to their first rehearsals, they were so scattered. I mean, those guys were like such knucklehead sobs, screaming, and like everybody yelling at each other. They would start to play a song and they'd all start at different times. And like, Vinny was playing basically a drum solo from beginning to end. He was an excellent drummer and he would just play all over the place. And and so always, always exactly the same when we got to the end of the song, they would just all start kind of like floundering. And then like one of them would stop and then Vinny would stop and then like Aunt, uh, Saab would keep playing. And then he would look at Vinny and go, what are you doing? And they would start arguing about what the ending was. I was like, shut up. <laughs> so who wrote the song? And Anthony would be like, I did. I said, show me how the ending goes plays it for me. I go, okay, that's the ending. Vinny, Anthony, and then Saab would start screaming. I was like, Anthony and 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 Vinny play the ending. They play it perfectly. I was like, okay, that's the ending. Anthony, show Saab the ending. I know the ending. I was like, clearly you do not know the ending. And it was this kind of ridiculous conversation. And then some of the songs didn't even have endings, so we just came up with endings. And uh, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but it was just so they were just so crazy and out of control. And then the next thing I started to notice was no matter how many times they tuned their guitars, they weren't in tune. And I said, I was like, what do you guys tune to? They were like C sharp, like carnivore. And I was like, well, that's a good choice. And I said, can I see your guitar? I just put it on and I went up to the tuner and I like plucked the string and the string was like rubber. Uh. And I went, Wait a second, what gauge are these strings? And they go, nines. Oh. <laughs> I said, you're tuned to C sharp and you're using nines? Yeah. And he, yeah. I was like, oh my God. And I went to Anthony. I was like, listen, carnivore, those guys use 11s. It's like when, when, when you loosen the string, you have to do something to compensate for the tension. Everybody knows this now, but like back yeah, then, right. not, not many people turning down. But I knew yeah, this was intonation a thing at that time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, not when, when you're wearing using nines and tuned down. But I knew all this <laughs> Pete, you know, Pete's yeah. me and Pete and Steele and and Mark talked about it a, a bit. Even though back then all the Chromax records were in standard tuning, so right. it wasn't a thing to me. And I played nines, 
So I took, I, I said to Anthony, I was like, listen, you're responsible for this. We need to take all the guitars. You're going to take them to my guitar tech. And we're going to have all the guitars set up with 11s and the bass set up of heavy gauge strings. And they're all going to be set up. And then we got all the guitars set up and they had other guitars to play with the rehearsal. And the first rehearsal with those guitars set up, it sounded like a completely different band. <laughs> and and Saab's girlfriend was in the rehearsal studio and she was so mad that they were in tune. She goes, you don't understand this kind of music. It's supposed to be out of tune or something. I remember hearing, and I was like, but listen to them. They sound like a band now. Wow. This is what the band sounds like. So we got that out of the way. And then the next thing in pre-production that we did was the drums. I said to Vinny, I was, uh, we would play a song, and uh, so some of the times that we rehearsed, George wasn't there. And so Vinny was just playing all through the verses, like all these like <laughs> drum fills everywhere. And I was like, I was like, I was like, is, is George singing during this part? He said, yeah. I said, then why are you doing a drum solo? He goes, well, uh, I said, when... Let's go through these parts and wherever George is singing, no toms. Wow. No toms at all. Yeah. I want to hear hi hat and snare. I want to hear drum beats. You're there to support the singer, not to crowd him. If you're going to do a fill, save your best fill for when he stops talking and then do your best fill. And he was, what are you talking about? I, this is the way I play. I was like, and this is another thing I would say, like Anthony, when, uh, when I first started, when I first started working, and like Anthony had this really super muddy sound, and and I was like messing with the knobs on his amps. He's like, "That's not my sound." I was like, "Shut up! You don't have a sound." And he was like, "Oh." oh. And when we were recording, <laughs> I brought in all my amps, wow. and I had one amp with a super clean Marshall sound, and I had like a much more yeah. distorted sound. And Anthony the whole time was like pulling his hair out. Like he was like, "This is." This is not what Marauder sounds like. This is not what Mar this is not my guitar sound. I was like, exactly. I'm building you a sound. You don't have a sound. You guys just sounded out of tune when I met you. And the entire time we were recording, they were all like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. And I was like, shut up, get out of the control room. Wow. Until they heard the first song mixed. Yeah. Yeah. And Anthony was like, he was just like looking at the ground. He's like, I'm so embarrassed because I'm so, he goes, I don't even know how to thank you. I can't believe we sound like this. I never thought we were ever getting the record label said the same thing. And, and guys from other record labels, a and guy from uh, Roadrunner Records said to me, he goes, if I would have known how this album would have sounded, I would have signed it. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. It's, it's a perfect record. They kept telling all the company people kept telling me, we want this record to sound like Machine Head. Because I guess the Machine Head album was really popular at the time. Right. And, yeah. and, this, and the singer of Machine Head was also up to produce the album. Oh. It was a oh. choice between the two of us. And because the label wanted the Machine Head sound. Uh, but I remember when I, when I sent them the first mix, you know, I, I played the mix for the band first. And the first thing they all said was, this sucks. The vocals are too loud. The vocals are too loud. And I knew that I knew this was going to happen. And I had like a multi stack CD rack in front of me. And I had Metallica, Green Day, Foo Fighters, Led Zeppelin, Alice in Chains, you know, just like any, yeah. any, just I said anything that's ever made money, money yeah. I went like this. And I pressed the Metallica one and I said, listen to how loud the vocals are. And we went back to our mix. I said, now listen to how loud George's vocals are. Yeah. And they're like, and they all went, oh, we never noticed how loud the vocals are. I said, because you're only concerned with hiding George's vocals. But we worked so hard on jo George's vocals, phrase by phrase, getting him, instead of singing this, to singing this. Right. You know, like singing yeah. notes and dynamic and giving, meaning, giving meaning to words and like stopping on a word and saying like, because he was just growling his head off. And they were like, this is our style of music. I was like, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. if, it, if you can't understand the words, it's not a song. So th th that, was the, that was the ethic I took. I said, I don't care what style you think you play. I don't care what sound you think you have. You hired me, and this is what you get. And my, <laughs> my goal is to create a record that if you listen to it 30 years from now, it'll sound like it was recorded that day. No, well, let me tell you something. Sound like drums, <laughs> bass, 
guitar and a singer in a room. The yeah. best they can be, the most in tune, the most understandable, the most articulated they could possibly be. And so I sent that. So after they, these guys got over how loud the vocals were, especially when I played them Alice in Chains, they also kept saying, the hi-hat is really loud. And I was like, Alice in Chains, boom. When you listen to an Alice in Chains mix, the, 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 the two loudest things in the mix are the vocals and the hi-hat. It's really odd. I think, oh, it must be guitar, right? But it's hi-hat and vocals. And that hat is your whole left ear. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I made notes on all these records. And, and I, I always had those notes in front of me. When, when we were mixing, we would stop and we would listen to a whole mix and only listen to one thing. Only listen to the hi-hat. Only listen to the ride song. Only listen to the toms. Only listen to the guitar. Only listen to Anthony's guitar. You know, it, and, and I just made the record the way I would have made it for myself. And to me, music is just music. There's no genre. There's no this you know my, you know it, it's got to be the drums have to be perfect first so i really worked like we walked into the studio and anthony and, and Vinny is like slowly unpacking his drums and then he's like got a plate of spaghetti and he's like eating a plate of spaghetti and i was and i grabbed the plate of spaghetti out of his hand i was like shut up your fucking drums and shut up every second you're wasting today is a day at the end it's a guitar solo that we can't do. It's a vocal take that we can't do one more time because you won't shut the fuck up. Set up your fucking drums and shut the fuck up. <laughs> Sets up his drums. And we and so we had to get those basic tracks out of the, out of the way. It's my understanding, and, and tell me if this is wrong, that he wrote a ton of those songs. Is that true? Absolutely. He, 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 was a, he played a major role in that band. Him and Anthony were yeah. the backbone of that band. And, uh, and, 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 and so I focused on those two guys. Sure. And, and yeah. you know, and I, and I focused on George when he came his time. But, you know, as, as a singer, you know, like I had to create the bed first. Yeah, I did yeah. the bed as perfect as it could possibly be. And, you know, the thing about George was like, George is like, I, I only know him from that period of time. I have no relationship with him now. Uh, but at that time, he was just like this really funny, energetic guy. Like At, at that time, I was a runner. I, I was running eight miles a day. Like we would finish recording at midnight. And I would put on my running shoes and I would run to uh, Newport Beach, which was an hour away. I would run an hour there and an hour back. And uh, I remember one night George says to me, oh, I'm going to run with you. And I was like, sure you are. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, do you run? He goes, no. I said, I'm going to be running for two hours. I run like this every night for years. There's no way you're going to be able to keep up with and also, he had been singing, and his throat was sore, and I told him that he wasn't allowed to talk. But it's not possible for George not to talk. <laughs> he is just one of those people. He just, like, on automatic pilot all the time, which is part of his charm, because he's all, yeah. I mean, if he was talking all the time, and he was, and he was, uh, you know, didn't have charm, it would be annoying, but he was so fucking funny and, I, and very likable. Yeah, he's hilarious. But, yeah. but we go out running, and he's running alongside me, talking, and the whole time I'm like, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Shut up, shut up, shut up, stop talking. But I couldn't get him to stop talking. And then the next thing you know, like we're running like this and he's talking and he runs out in front of me and he flips backwards and he's running in front of me backwards so he could talk to me. And I'm thinking, oh, he's going to get tired real quick. And he did the entire two hours with me. Oh, shit. Never broke, like never like puffed or puffed. Like he'd been running his whole life. And I was like, what the hell? Is this like <laughs> superior Puerto Rican genetics, uh, genetics or something? That sounds like something the master killer would do. You know? <laughs> yeah. But that was, you know, those, those are my kind of like personal experience. But like, but then during the day, I would have to chase, sob around and take pot from them and, and flush it down the toilet. And, you know, any kind of drugs I found, I was like, you guys cannot be doing drugs for 30 days. You're not doing drugs. For 30 days, you're being, going to be lucid. You know, once your tracks are done, you can do whatever you want. But while we're doing these tracks, I need lucidity. I need focus. I need you guys. You know, I don't have time to do this 50,000 times. We just got to get it done. Right. Uh, and we barely, we barely, we barely did. And we, and oh, I God, did you? Turned yeah. the album in on time. We did not wow. go. I turned it, I turned it in the day on day 29. We turned that album in. We're, we're obviously eating up a lot of time. I have one more question that I've been dying to ask for a long time. Back to the beat real quick. I wrote this at the very bottom of my notes, so I almost missed it. Uh, you mentioned Peter Steele. There's a rumor <laughs> that Peter Steele is in the crowd at that show. Was it at the Ritz? Yeah, it was at the Ritz. 
and Pete was a friend of mine at, at that time. So I might have noticed, but you got to understand that place held, I guess, I'm not sure, 2,000 people. And it was packed and it was a film set. So we were on stage with lights in our eyes and just a ton of people. I don't recall seeing him, him that day. It was a lousy day. We like flew in. You know, we were there at seven o'clock in the morning. And from the second we hit the stage, Harley was in rare Harley be an asshole form and uh, wasn't cooperating with the director and the director left the set mm -hmm. and he was just being a pest. Like he, he likes to control a room and some, some people like Lionel Richie control a room with charm and some people control a room by being the biggest asshole in the world. And that's what he would do. And that's what he did that day. So there was a lot of like frustration as always that gotcha. day. Uh, gotcha. with, with the with between us and the film crew you know the idea was that we were supposed to play yeah and then film and play and film that kind of thing over the course of the day but we ended up sh uh stopping shooting for quite a long time and then there was a terrible terrible incident that happened where a kid jumped off the speakers and broke his back oh no Shit. my god uh, so he was up on the pa speakers and he just did like you know he was going for being in the movie i guess and he fell and broke his back and production swept in and took him out of the club like so fast. We didn't even know what happened wow. until wow. afterwards. And when, you know, afterwards we found out all about it and how the, you know, there was lawsuits against the club and against the against the uh, film company, which was Vestron at the time, which no longer exists. Apparently the kid was a, a big fan of the band and he insisted that we as a band not be sued. Oh wow. <laughs> And I, to this day, I've never encountered him. I, mm. You know, I don't. I don't even know what the, the what happened. The only, the I wonder only, if that I, shot made the final cut. I don't. <laughs> I don't, I don't think, think so. so. And and most people don't know this, but like when you go to a concert and there's a barricade, that's because of us. No fucking way. That's because of that day. The barricade law was uh, was brought in because of that day. Thanks a lot, Paris. <laughs> <laughs> One of the stars awesome. of the movie was uh, Paul Dillon. It was Matt Dillon's brother. Oh, I mean, really? it was dreadful. You, it's like impossible to watch the movie. Yeah, it's not I've watched good. it. I've watched it. It's yeah, not it's not good. good. Yeah. But Matt Dillon was a big hardcore fan. He used to come to all the shows at the Rock Hotel shows. Wasn't he yeah. cast for The Outsiders just by being like a local, like little fucker in school? Like a <laughs> bad boy. That, you're mixing it up a little bit. He was in My Bodyguard. Oh, okay. Mm. He was he was in a My he was in a playground apparently he was scouted like somebody walked by and saw him you know like being wow. Matt Dillon. So my dad's favorite whatever. movies. And uh, so I think by the time uh, by '86 it was I think he was already a star. Okay. Yeah, I got a really important question for you, Paris. This is huge. This is something that people have been dying to know for the past decade. You end this interview by talking about a new band you're working on. And the name of this band steals the show from everything you just said before. <laughs> You're talking about starting a band called Blood for Papa. Blood for Papa. When can we hear <laughs> Blood for Papa? <laughs> well, this essentially is Blood for Papa. Ah, perfect. See, wow. I, you know, I was at that time. I guess I. I, I got this idea that I was going to start a band, like a traditional band, and I began looking for people. And Rob Buckley, who I co-wrote Alpha Mega, was one of the guys. And there was this, a bunch of different bass players, a bunch of different drummers. And, um, and, I, and it was just this weird kind of thing where I had all these songs written, but all the other guys that I kept trying to enlist wanted to play different kind of music. Like Rob wow. one day came and he was like, um, I really like the Black Crows. Can we be more like the Black Crows? I was like, see, something like that doesn't compute to me because I don't understand. Yeah. Let's yeah. be like a band. I write songs, mm -hmm. and whatever songs I write are the band. So, like, that's why I always say, like, you know, everybody Harley always tells everybody his big plan to start the Crow Mags and all that kind of stuff. You, you can't have a plan that didn't take into consideration my song. What a song, what a band is, is the sum of the songs. So. When Rob said that to me, I was like, well, you know, I don't really do what the, I love the Black Crows. I don't really do what they do, but I do this. Right. So 
let's do this. But then I find myself go, you know, the next day, sit down with my guitar and write a song that sounded like the Black Crows. And then the other guys came in and I show it to everybody and we yeah. play it. And when we're done playing it, I'm like, wow, that really sounds like the Black Crows. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like smiling to myself, like, because I accomplished something. And the drummer's looking at me like this. And I'm like, what? He goes, he goes you're, not, you're not really planning on playing that bullshit, are you? And I was like, what? And, and this, this happened increment, incrementally over a, a long period of time where I had all these people that were pulling me in different directions. Instead of me just doing what I do and being the spearhead of the band, which is what I should have been, I, I tried to cater to all these people. Because, again, I, I, I had that beaten down ego, music ego. Like I wasn't just the guy who walked to the front and started steering the ship. I yeah. wanted everybody to be happy. So I started catering to everybody. <clears throat> and the next thing you know, we had like this catalog of songs that just didn't make any sense. And <clears throat> the working title of that band was Blood for Papa. The first person to quit was Rob. <laughs> and uh, luckily, he just called me up one day. He was like, I, after I completely molded the band towards it, what he wanted to do, he, he quit. And then the next day we went in to rehearse. And I just like showed the bass player like one of my super heavy songs. And, like in one day, we went from like the Black Crows being heavy again. And then <laughs> over the course of like a couple of months, I I started assembling songs like Chaos Magic and and uh, Skateboard Fight and you know, songs off this album. Mm. And uh, but, and then the bass player, you know, of course, you know, I I never learn. I always say that I'm never gonna have another junkie in the band, but. Uh, he was a, he had been a former junkie and been begging me to play with him for for like two years, and I'd always run into him and be like, "Paris, please, please, let's play together," you know. And but his eyes would be pinned. I was like, "There's no way I'm going to be in a band with an addict." And he got into some kind of legal problems and he had to go to rehab. And mm -hmm. when he got out of rehab, he was like looked like a t totally different person. And he came to me and he gave me this whole sob story, and and I agreed to let him in. And and he was in the band for a little while, and one day he showed up high. Of course. And then he lies. He's like, he's like, oh, I just took some cold medicine. I was like, oh my God, how many times have I heard this? I don't know, how many times have I heard the cold medicine story? Do I look high? I'm like, yeah, you look high because you're high. And he went off into rehab. And when he got back from rehab, he told me he can't be in the band anymore because he can't be around people that he, he knew when he was a drug addict. I said, I'm the only person you know who doesn't do drugs. <laughs> So he went by the wayside. Just the least enabling guy possible. <laughs> the guy actively trying to stop. And then I found, and then I actually found Cobbs, the drummer who plays plays most of the tracks on this album. He plays on Chaos Magic and the video songs. And it was just me and him. And, and it was just, we like never went anywhere. And, and I think it was the end. I, I said to him, uh, I'm not getting what I need out of this band. Uh, and he goes, what do, you, what do you need? I was like, we've been playing for three years. We don't have anything recorded. So this is, this is still Blood for Papa at this time. Yeah, it was still called Blood for Papa. We had t-shirts and everything. <laughs> you, got yeah. any, you, got, you got you one got any, for me? You got any you larges? Got <laughs> I, look. I, I know I have picks made. I have like 5,000 Blood for Papa picks that I never used. But uh, I said to, I said to cops, I was like, hey, man, uh, can, I, uh, can, can we just record one of my songs? And so I made a click map to Chaos Magic, which is like a seven minute long song with a million tempo changes. We mapped the whole thing out. It took like a week. I think by the time we finished doing the click map, he was fed up. Uh. And then I said, now I need you to play it like I want you to play it. This is not a death metal song. I don't want to hear double bass. No double bass. He's like a double bass maniac. He's like a virtuoso drummer in his, you know, but he wants to play a certain way. I was like, this is a hardcore song. It's not only a hardcore rock song. It's to me, my hardcore epic. I need you to play it the way it's written. And I said, and it's all written in the rhythm. And we sat and we, we basically punched it bar by bar or section by section. Mm -hmm. And it took us probably a week to do that entire song. And once we wow. were done with that song, I think he was done with me. <laughs> he was just like, I don't want to do it this way. I was like, what? Well, yeah, but you but I, I I made this click map like a year before, and he had a year to play on, but he didn't play on. Mm. So anyway, we finished that one, and I and I talk him into doing two more songs. We did those two songs. Those two songs are on this record too. But once that once we finished that, he basically said, "Get out of my studio." And then I put it out. And when I put it out, I got a t I got a call from him immediately. He's like, "Hey man, it's Cobbs. 
And I hadn't heard from him since he threw me out of, my studio, out of his studio, which is humorous that he's calling me. I'm like, hmm, God is calling me. Like, hello? He's like, <laughs> so I saw the video. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> but he goes, what the fuck is wrong with me? I go, what do you mean? He goes, how did I not realize how great this was when we were making it? I was like, I don't know. I, I, when we were done, I couldn't believe you weren't just proud of it. But you were just mad at me instead yeah. of being proud of it. He goes, well, I'm proud of it now. Good. I was like, it's great to hear. And we ended up talking on the phone and, uh, and I ended up bringing him out on tour this summer. When we played. Lovely. Beautiful. But, uh, yeah, blood for Papa. That was, uh, <laughs> that was during a period of time where there was this like, kind of like weird Chrome eggs stalker who follow, you know, the, there's these people that find their way into a band. They kind of like weasel their way into a band some way, oftentimes by being an enabler. Mm-hmm. Oh. And uh, he he was one of those people that got into the band, and he lived up in Yonkers. He was he was uh, in the neighborhood where the son of Sam w- was from, David Berkowitz, or not son of Sam. Subsequently, it's been found out that it wasn't actually David Berkowitz, but the guy who was arrested and who was currently in jail for those killings, David Berkowitz, lived up there. And this guy was kind of obsessed with him, and he would take us to uh, <clears throat> he would take me to like his apartment on Palm on Pine Street and he explained to me how like when he was 12, when the police were up in the apartment, like back then they already thought they had the killer. So there was no crime scene tape. And I, he goes, I just took the back stairs up and I walked right into the apartment with all the detectives and looked around when I was like 12 years old in David Berkowitz's apartment the day he was arrested. And he was like, read the letters, you know, and there were all these letters that the son of Sam sent to Jimmy yeah. Breslin from the, the post. And uh, <clears throat> in, in one of the letters, you know, he talks about like looking out the window and Papa Sam and, you know, and it's obviously written by these, one of these two guys. It's not written by David Berkowitz. That's and, uh, but, but while we were perusing these letters and listening, and I was listening to this insane guy wax poetic about this insane mystery while we were perusing the letters, which are all, they're interesting, fascinating letters because there's directions to David Berkowitz's apartment and code. So we ended up combing these letters. Yeah, but there was this one passage where uh, he's saying, you know, I must go out and hunt. I must get blood, blood for Papa, Papa Sam. And I was like, oh, blood for Papa. And then Ghost came to prominence. Yeah, yeah. Papa Emeritus. It just didn't make any sense anymore that he was because that word Papa. Yeah, it's it's theirs now. You heard it here. That's some hard ass lore, man. Justice for Papa, dude. Paris, this was unbelievable. I think our audience is going to learn a lot. Yep. I I'm curious as a filmmaker before we wrap, do you have a four favorite movies of all time? I'd say the longest running one that's stayed in the top two all these years is Blade Runner. Wow. How do you I've feel seen, about the Blade Runner twenty forty nine? Uh yeah, I'm yeah, I'm glad they didn't never made that. I'm glad it never went into production. But at first <laughs> Yeah, very not memorable. I mean, not that I'm not <laughs> a fan of Ryan Gosling. But, uh, you know, he couldn't, he didn't carry that movie. To me, I found it extremely boring. It looks Mm -hmm. great, though. I can't remember anything about it. Mm. You don't remember Uh, Deacons going hard as shit and making it look incredible? Nothing like uh, the original Blade Runner looked like. But the thing about movies is, like, it doesn't matter how it looks. If, Mm. you know, the thing is, like, you came out of the movie theater after you watched Star Wars, and you were like, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia. You knew all their names. The right. characters meant something to you in those two hours. By the time the movie was over, you were invested. You knew who these people were. You missed them when the movie was over. <laughs> when this new Blade Runner movie was over, I couldn't even remember who was in it. I was like, oh, yeah, Harrison Ford was in it for a second. <laughs> but when you, watched, when you watched the original Blade Runner, you were like, Gaff, Zora, you know, like Deckard, you know, right. all of them. And, 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 and quoting the lines, there are a million great lines in Blade Runner. Name, quickly give me a quote from the new Blade Runner movie. Ah. <laughs> I want more life, fucker. The lines are poetic. The visuals are poetic. The, the yeah. acting, Rutger Hauer, I mean, come on. R.I.P. And Harrison Ford's best fucking role. Yeah. It's, it's, what do you it's, think it's, about uh, the funny, the funny uh, noir voiceover intro it was the future the original theater release had the 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 voiceover is that what you prefer 
I do, because I've seen it many, many times, and I've seen it without the voiceover, and the, vo mm. the voiceover is necessary. It's a good guide, but it sounds insane. <laughs> but the visuals were all based on the on the idea that there would be this narrative. So, you know, usually in storytelling, it's oh, show, don't tell. Yeah. But but because they were telling, it wasn't shown. They mm. were, there were, would have been too many big gaps. And then subsequently, they did a release without the. They've done many releases. They yeah. did the release without the, without the voiceover, which I didn't like. Maybe because I had already seen it like fifty times with it. Yeah. And then they did another edit, where they added one shot, which I thought made the movie better. Because it, it uh, you know, because the way the original ending, the way the original one ends, you don't know. You know, they, they pose this question, you know, have you ever taken that test, that void count test yourself, Decker? Yeah. When Rachel says that to him. Yeah. You know, uh, hinting on it because she discovers that she's a replicant. She didn't right. even know. And that's so, the right. whole the whole point of the ending is, oh, was he or wasn't he? Just right. like the thing. He, but there was a scene shot in the movie that that was taken out. Um, uh -huh. And that and that scene was. There's a there's a scene in the middle of the in the, in the movie where he and Rachel are, are sitting at the piano and he takes a drink and he sits on the couch and falls asleep, right? And in the movie he just kind of wakes up and then they he grabs her and they make out and all that kind of stuff. But in, but the, what Ridley Scott shot was a dream sequence where he has a dream of a unicorn, mm. right? So it's just all you're doing is witnessing Deckard have a dream, right? right? So now mm. we as the audience know his dream. So, but that wasn't in the original cut. So wow. at the end of the movie, when he goes back to his apartment and Gaff has left that little origami unicorn, mm. that's Gaff saying, I read your file. I know your dreams. But that unicorn had no meaning without that scene. Right. It was <laughs> just, it was just, it was just Deckard knowing that he had been there. Interesting. What's the, is the what's the poem the like do do whatever dream of electric sheep is that that's for Blade Runner right? Yeah, it's a novel by Philip K. Dick. Right. Great book. Read right in high great, school. Great writer. Times. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of good stuff. Which is like that seems that seems like also kind of the whole point of like well he's dreaming of a normal unicorn so I don't know if a robot can do that. <laughs> you think he's well, a replicant? Is that what you're saying? Oh, he is a replicant. Yeah, you think I always, so. I always thought he was. Is. that was that was Gaff. How else would Gaff have known about the unicorn? He read his file. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> this isn't my interpretation. This is what really right. All right. And it's, and it's clear. It's like, why else would Gaff leave that unicorn behind? Because, right. you know, the whole point was everything that Rachel said to him was, you know, she tells a story about the, the spider that builds a web outside of her window. And then the thousand baby spiders come out and eat the mama you right, know yeah. she goes i don't know whether that's my my memory or or one of tyrell's nieces and because they have all these memory implants they give them all these memories to think that they're an actual person right so deckard's dream was an implant and gaff was telling him that i know your dreams by showing him the unicorn mm. and that changes the whole context of the movie and now they did they did a more recent uh, edit where they changed my favorite line in the movie. I mean, I remember in 1982 being in the movie theater and Rutger Howard going up to Tyrell and going, I want more life, fucker. All right, well, check this out. Ridley Scott considers Deckard a replicant. Harrison Ford considers De Deckard a replicant, which, you know, they've retconned in the sequel. Hampton Fancher and David Peoples, who wrote the screenplay, do not consider Deckard a replicant. Oh. And in the novel by Philip K. Dick, he is not a replicant. So who do we believe? Who do we trust here? <laughs> it's, it's just like the Chromax. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because the film is a standalone thing. Yeah. yeah. And in the very first cut, it was left ambiguous. Right. Because the film production company didn't want it to be depressing. No. Oh, but they took out the dream of the unicorn that ha and they put in that whole scene at the end where they fly off and they're like, who knows yeah. how much time. 
when the, when Ridley Scott made the movie, it was clear that he was a replicant, and then the movie ends with Gaff telling him, "You are a replicant. Know your dreams." Interesting. Gotcha. Well, there you have it, and that's hey, our hard lore Blade read the, Runner discussion. <laughs> read, the, read the book; it's fabulous. I've I've read it many times. It's, he's got a lot of good books. The Solar yeah, Lottery is. is excellent. Minority and, Report. Uh, Flow my tears. The policeman said are my three favorites. So those three. Beautiful. There's quite a lot. Of, he was very prolific. If only I could read. You know, <laughs> well, I got to start there. Well, Paris, thank you so much for your exorbitant amount of time. This was, yes. this was unbelievable. This is an instant classic. It'll be the talk of the town. Are there any kind of final thoughts you'd like to leave the listeners with, you know, the Chromax fans, the Paris fans, the Chromax haters? I'm just a guy who writes songs, figures out a way to get them out there. I'm glad a lot of people like them. Fuck. Yeah. If you, if you're one of those people, uh, I'm glad you got to listen to this, and uh, I hope you listen to my new album, Rise of the Agros. Yes, right. listen to Rise of the Agros. That's exactly what I'm going to uh, be doing. I can't wait to, to listen to Rise of the Agros, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Go, to, go to my YouTube page, uh, youtube.com slash the Agros, and subscribe, because it makes a difference if you want to support the band, especially in a time where artists aren't wait, making any money and um, you want to support them. Yeah. Uh, promoters, they look at subscriptions. Yep. They look at likes and all those kinds of things. So if you, if you subscribe to my YouTube page, it makes it more likely that I'll get booked and play more shows. And that's my goal. I want to come out. I want to go on the road and support this record and play this music live that I worked so hard on, harder than I worked on anything in my entire life. You like the programs, you'll like you'll like the aggros. It'll be very familiar to you. It'll just be a lot more. There you go. Period. Thank you so much for your time, Paris. Thank you all for watching and listening. We will see you next week. Bye.